set a strategy, develop a strategy, go get a book on strategic planning and, uh, you know, put your life plan and your career plan into a strategy and adopt core values that are important and that are, uh, that will guide your ability to reach those goals. What are the things that, you know, you need to believe in and live by to reach your, your personal and your professional goals and don't waver for them from them set goals, set accountability, set, set tasks that have to be done every day and look at them and say, the things that I'm doing or the things that I have to do, what is the purpose for it? Where is it going to lead me? And if you can't answer those questions, if it's not going to lead to anything, including television, sorry, you know, uh, don't do them. Do something that's going to lead to something and uh, don't, don't uh, spend your time, invest it. Invest your time into something. That's my best advice. Whatever it takes, no excuses, if you want it. Welcome to Get After It. My name is John Kay, and I'm a professional musician, record producer, and lifestyle entrepreneur. In each episode of Get After It, I talk with an inspiring person with a powerful message to help you discover how to realize your true potential and become your most authentic self through positive intention and purposeful action. I'm truly grateful to those of you listening right now. So without further ado... Let's get after it. My guest today is an accomplished businesswoman from the city of Flint, Michigan. Yes, that Flint, Michigan. She is one of the founders of Phase Media Group, a full-service artist management and music marketing company that provides labels, artists, and management companies the strategies and tools to develop artists, build effective business practices, and launch careers in music. Their services include artist management, artist and label consultation, artist development, album release campaigns, tour marketing campaigns, social media marketing, mobile marketing, email marketing, crowd crowdfunding, licensing and synchronization, strategic planning and business planning, fanalytics, corporate <laughs> sponsorship, marketing and new revenue, sponsorship, public relations and promotions. I've had the fortune to get to know and work with this force of a human being on and off mm -hmm. over the last eight years, and I've had a front row seat to her and her clients rapid ascendance in the global heavy metal community since. I am honored that she carved out a couple of hours to talk with me and grateful for the opportunity to share her stories and wisdom with my audience. Ladies and gentlemen, the indomitable. Velda Garcia. Velda, Aww. welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi there, John Kay. I love you. Oh, you're so sweet. Hey, <laughs> let's cheers because we're uh, drinking wine. Cheers. Thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, mm, sippy. Ooh. My favorite. Thank you very much. Oh, good. There's that rat bastard. I was trying to get him before uh, you walked in. I have a millipede to kill. <laughs> <laughs> <Seriously. laughs> Be careful with all your fancy equipment. Oh, you fucker. Oh, you dropped him. Oh, you John is bending down, trying to get it. He's getting ready to hit his head yeah, on a speaker. Right. Scrambling to get a millipede out of the corner oh, in his him. studio. Hell yeah. And he gets him. I got him. Down the toilet he goes. I got him. It's Jackie's least favorite. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I did the pay by, yeah, play by play. That was great. That was great. Ah. <laughs> oh, yes. Good. Oh. I'm sure this is great podcast content right now. Yeah, Jackie... Uh, hates millipedes so as every woman does right fair enough right uh so good well at least it's gone i tried to get it before you got here and when i came back in i didn't see it anywho ah, so how's life been treating you pretty good <laughs> uh, pretty good the boys are on a break right now and i know you have uh we kind of started talking about it but you have a a, a new man in your life oh, that, geez. You're, that you're very spend too much time on that. <laughs> <laughs> but no yeah i do right on and kids are growing up you got a new house in Northville mm -hmm. that you're loving, mm -hmm. and I, I see lots of nice landscaping on it. Thank you. Yeah. I try my best. <laughs> you, so you're out there with the green thumb? Oh, yeah. I'm out there picking weeds and doing what I can. Right on. So I should take some lessons from you then because I do not have mm -hmm. a green thumb. I mow the lawn. I'll edge it. I'll weed whack it or whatever. But what? Your yard is beautiful. Oh, thanks so much. Um, so my first thing that I like to do with people is just ask you to take us back to, you know, where you, you know, your socioeconomic conditions, where you were growing up, what school was like, what did your mom and dad do, you know, just what was, yeah. you know, what was the whole dynamic? But, but before I do that, why don't you go into what's currently going on with Phase Media and what you've been actively up to in the past couple of months? Because I know you just announced a big tour for one of your artists. That's right. Yeah. Today, um, Black Fast um, 
a black and thrash metal band mm-hmm. from St. Louis. Um, was named um, um, to be on the seventh year of the Metal Alliance tour. Uh, that's Steve Seabury's project. Uh, he's from E1 uh, Entertainment. He's uh, one of the label guys that we deal with. Well, he's had a, a tour um, for many years with Dan Rosenblum mm. from now with the Circle Agency, um, booking agency. And um, it's been a fantastic uh, tour in the past. Um, who was it? Behemoth was last year, the headliner. Uh, this year it's Overkill. It's uh, Overkill, Crowbar Havoc, um, Black Fast, and an opener I didn't check. But I saw that something one's earlier awesome. There. And they're getting ready to go into the studio with Eric Rutan from Haiti Eternal for their second album on E1. Is that in Canada that they're doing that? Nope. Uh, Eric is out of um, Tampa St. Pete's. Gotcha. Okay. And he's amazing. He did you know the Goat Horror Records and... Um, uh, what's um, Pig Destroyer? He's just a fantastic. These are these are uh, for Death the audience bands. that is uninitiated to the the heavy metal scene. These are bands that are reputable and pretty pretty well known across the country and respected and a lot of loyal fans. Yeah. And I know when did you first start getting into metal music? Um, I think in high school I really loved the heavy metal and the hair metal and all of that sort of thing. And then I went on to college, and then you know my taste started to. You know, um, um, you know, be a little bit more diverse, and you know, getting into um, you know college music, and uh, you know, but I always loved heavy metal, mm-hmm. and I didn't start getting into it again, um, probably until I don't know, ten or fifteen years, you know, because I was busy having kids, you know, went to college, you know, became a social worker, and started my career. And started to popping out babies left and right. <laughs> left and right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, and. Um, and then I met Dan, Death Metal Dan, who just kind of brought me back into it. Death and, Metal Dan? Yeah, you know, Dan Faze. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you drummers. Yep. And um, so, you know, he and I started dating, and, you know, I kind of just, like, picked up where we left off, you know, um, you know, for my musical tastes and such. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he introduced me back to some of the old, you know, I'm a big fan of power metal. Power metal. Okay, yeah, give give yeah. a couple examples of uh, oh, a bands that we consider power metal. Well, gosh, um, oh, where can I go with with um? Well, you know, I do have um, a power metal band on my uh, roster. Crimson, Crimson Shadows. Shadows. Yeah, they're yeah. awesome. Um, they're from Toronto. They're from yeah, they're from Toronto, and okay. they're on Napalm Records. Okay, and uh, they're just fantastic. Um, but you know, I love the power metal vocals. I just um, you know, I just like that shit that makes me want to slay dragons. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say ride on a dragon exactly. through the sky, and, yeah, right. Anything. And, and those types of things. Well, anyways, um, you know, Dan introduced me, uh, you know, to a lot of people in the Detroit area because I was never in the music scene, sure. you know, because by the time I left Flint, um, you know, I was having a career and, you know. You're in the business world. Yeah. You were working exactly. for the, I know you were doing the Detroit Science Center. Yeah, I did. I, I was a nonprofit uh, administrator, a uh, corporate fundraiser for many, many years. I started off as a social worker in the nonprofit world and, um, you know, started writing grants and raising money. And I did that for a long time. And um, that's where, um, you know, I met Dan and, you know, through that world, and I ended up doing this on my own. I'm sorry, did you want me to talk about Flint? I couldn't remember. Oh, yeah, we can go back to that. But no, um, you started off as a social worker. Is that what you went to school for? I mm-hmm. thought you, okay, right on. Yeah, my degree is in social work. Growing up in Flint, uh, you know, my mom and, you know, service to the community was always something that was very important to my family and something that, you know, a lot of people in my family did. Okay, so now let's go then. Okay. To take us back. when you're As you're growing up, when you're a kid, your childhood memories, you know, what did mom and dad do? You know, what was the community like? What was school like? Things oh, like that. Just paint the picture. I had a fantastic childhood. You know, as many horrible things that people say about Flint. Um, and yeah, you know, it is rough and it is bad and there was bad experiences and bad things that I saw. But I had a fantastic, fantastic childhood. Um, I grew up on the east side of Flint. Uh, my mother was an, a school administrator, um, and my dad worked at General Motors in the metal fabrication, skill trades. Um, you know, I had an older brother, older sister. I lived in a just a regular middle class, you know, what was considered middle class for Flint. Uh, you know, we had vacations all the time. We went up north. We had cabin up north. You know, everything that a family who's, 
you know, employed by General Motors, I guess. Sure. And I went to, a, um, I was in the gifted program uh, all through uh, all through life. I skipped grades, went to a special learning center. Then I went to a special gifted program at Whittier Middle School and then continued on next door to Flint Central High School and Flint Northern Inner City Schools. I had, um, it was in a fantastic area of town in the cultural center where there were libraries and planetarium and the Flint Institute of Arts and Flint Institute of Music and the Sloan Museum and the Planetarium all on the same campus. Um, I had great friends. I'm close to them still, and I learned uh, valuable lessons in life and hard work ethics and everything like that. And I love Flint, Michigan, and I'm proud to say I'm a Flintstone. Yes, you are a very proud Flintstone. That is, that is well known to anyone that knows you. Um, it's been said that metal is, quote-unquote, has been and always will be a genre for outsiders. Do you have thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I do. Because I think at one time, maybe it was, but when I look at the data and I look at the people who listen and who come to shows, and the more I interact with them, they're not outsiders at all. I mean, sure, there's an element of them that are absolutely, you know, um, the outsiders, but there's a great group of them who were who are people like me who grew up on it in the 80s and you know the early 90s and loved it and never really lost a love for it mm. and now there's music coming out again that you know they dig and you know isn't the bullshit stuff that came out in the 90s or whatever mm. and they're really identifying with it you know that the thrash is coming back and you know when I look at our fan base I see a you know a lot of people just like me mm-hmm. you know but they're men of course you know professionals mm-hmm. you know there's um I don't think that. I don't think that they're outsiders. No, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of people identify with this type of music. You just don't know it. Sure, yeah. sure. I like that answer. Um, I talk too you, fast. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. I smoke that doobie, so I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, everyone. She likes it. Um, I like the small deck even better. Yeah, nice. Thank nice. You. You're very welcome. My pleasure. I, I want to piggyback on something you said. You said when you were answering that question, you said when I look at the data and I did it, you're constantly looking oh, at data. Data know. is your life. I love data. Okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know what? It's the new oil. Yeah, absolutely, it is the new oil. You mm. remember that post that I made? Mm-hmm. Aww. Mm-hmm. Mm. I pay attention to thought leaders. That you, and that's 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 what you have become. I don't know, I don't know if you have recognized or if people have recognized you for it, but you are a thought leader within within what you do and within the circle of people I know. I consider you a thought leader. You know, my ex husband was saying the same thing yesterday. It's weird to me, and because I, I, it's weird to me that people even care what I have to say or even listen to what I have to say. Yeah, you were you were like, I don't know who's going to listen to this podcast. I'm, it's probably not even going to do well. It's like, no, nah, this will be one of my most downloaded episodes oh, so far. No, but you, you're, you talked about learning your work ethic growing up, and then now you talk about data. Mm-hmm. Those two, that is basically what you do. That is what drives how you make decisions yeah. and how you and your artists make decisions. Absolutely. You're not basing it on emotions. No. You're not basing it on what ifs. Uh, you're basing it on hard data that right. you've researched based on, you know, wh- whether it's keywords and phrases, the different mm-hmm. social media sites, the hits you're getting on websites, things like that. Yeah. You have figured out a way that works for you and brought your talents f- from working in, d- in the business world into the music industry world. How do you, where do you see a lot of overlap between how to run a band as a business and then just how to run any business? It's complete 100% overlap. It doesn't matter if you're selling hot dogs, you know, skin cream or heavy metal music. There's still basic business practices that, you know, apply in all of them. And data drives those decisions. Um, You know, you can't run a business by what you think needs to happen or what another business does. Uh, You know, you have to collect the data to determine specifically, you know, you know, to make the right decisions, uh, you know, otherwise you're just guessing. And how do you even know where to start with what data to collect oh. for a band? Because, okay, and it, let's answer that question and then, and then that'll lead me to my next mm-hmm. question. But yeah, how do you even begin to well, come into it and say, as a band, what data do we really need? Oh, well, I mean, there's so much data that you, you know, 
you need all of it. You know, how much you're going to use of it is a different story, you know, or what it, you know, what it says and what it interprets. But I mean, first of all, in the music industry or any industry, whether it's I'm selling slacks or I'm selling, you know, music, like I said, you want to know who your customer is, you know, where they are and, you know, how much they spend, Mm. what they're interested in buying, what shows are they interested in going and uh, what size do they wear? So you can make decisions like ordering your merchandise, pro- you know, properly. Or where do they live so that when you're on tour, you can target them and make sure they come to your shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, it's just common sense. If you, you know, you have some common sense and, you know, you can think through multiple steps of things, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Then, you know, anyone can do it. Because, you know, the, the platforms out there now have insights and analytics that you know, take the data and put it in a picture for you, so anybody can understand. And you're a multiple tab oh, browser. Yeah. Have I sh- shared my screen with you before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or taken a screenshot? Right. You, you're definitely a multiple tab browser. What applications do you have run when you're when you're in full working on stuff for your one of your artist mode? Give us give the audience uh, some examples of some of some software or some applications that you that you rely on on a day to day basis. Um, I know you like Hootsuite a lot. Yeah, I do like Hootsuite, and I like you know the ability to schedule posts and monitor chatter and uh, you know I don't do it as much as I should you know because I could spend co- literally all day long looking at the data. So um, you know Hootsuite, uh, Social Bro- well Social Bro is now Autosense. Autosense gives you some other insights and gives you some other tools. Autosense. Uh, yeah, oh. Audi Sense, like Audi-sense. audience. Or oh, oh okay, got gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll use that to you know measure best times to tweet. Uh, look who my influencers, those thought leaders. Sure. You know, right. The music equivalent of that. Um, I'll do direct campaigns. Um, uh, you know, direct message campaigns. I'll, you know, I'll use that. That you know, it's mostly a Twitter tool. Um, you know, I use Hootsuite uh, to schedule posts for you know Twitter, Facebook, and um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Instagram, um, Facebook Analytics, the Business Manager for those of us who advertise on on Facebook. I'll have Twitter open the analytics or the the ad platform. I always have Google Analytics open on my phone because oops, I just burped. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that uh, you know when I run merch specials and sales from the Battle Cross page or any of the artist page, I like to look in real time mm-hmm. the page visits and what they're looking at and what they're buying because that then helps me make de- make decisions on um, you know what I see what they're clicking on you know a higher profit item would go first you know um, how many people are abandoning at the you know checkout um, how and more importantly how they got there where did they you know see the post or see the ad to click through so that that can help me uh, determine my which of my investments and which marketing tools are working. Yeah, I, I recall a specific instance uh, when you and I were talking and you talked about how you figured out that you, or you did an experiment with just changing the, the cover photo oh, thumbnail yes. oh, for a uh, music video yeah, where yeah. it was like we were we weren't getting enough plays and then I changed the thumbnail to this still shot from of the Gumby. Uh, yeah just his raging yeah. viking face yeah and that right there just yeah. got people to click and yeah. you know like 6000% right more clicks right but see and see now but the thing is is you come from you coming from the business world and having no preconceived notions about how to quote unquote manage a band or no. quote unquote work in the music industry because it it gives you a completely different paradigm on how to approach things uh, than most people. Because as you said, you weren't quote, unquote, I keep saying quote unquote, part of my verbiage. You weren't in the music scene, as right. you said. So therefore you weren't, I'm going to use the word poisoned by other people's detritus and their way of doing it. You, right. You'd found out your own way based yeah. on what made most sense to you. Right. And pl- yeah. Because I, I just, the only thing I did know was to put together some sort of strategic plan. And when I met Battlecross, it was called the TOW plan, T-O-W, take over the world plan. Okay. And tonight we are working on phase two of TOW. So it's been nine years since we developed the TOW plan and mm-hmm. we totally surpassed it. See, that's beautiful. And I want to talk about that meeting specifically. Okay. Before that though, when and how did you first discover that you wanted to begin managing bands? It was, I know it was Battlecross is what drew you into that, but... Go ahead. And- Again, it was Death Metal Dan. Death Metal Dan phase is responsible for all of this. Um, okay, sorry. I don't want you to feel um, like you have to lean in on. We were dating. Mm-hmm. 
and he just thought I was just the bomb. You well, know, hello. Business, oh, stop. <laughs> you know, he just thought I was the bomb because I was making all sorts of shit happen at the Science Center and building additions and millions of dollars for the, the exhibits. And he, you know, and mm. so he started, you know, taking me to shows. And, you know, I was having kids and working. I had never been to the, you know, the places he was taking me. You know, I was, I was, I'm from Flint. I didn't do the, the fun hangout adult shit, party shit in the Detroit, in Detroit, you know. Mm-hmm. With the, like the Detroit scene people, I had no right. idea. I knew people from Flint. So, um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question: When and how did you oh, yeah, first decide question. that you, or discover that you wanted to begin managing bands? Okay, so he takes me to a show. Or no, no. Oh, we were dating. We were chatting or talking. I don't remember. And we weren't totally together yet. And he's like, you know, I'm going to be at the Token or whatever. So I went up to the Token, mm. and I don't even think he showed up. I don't yeah. even remember. I don't even remember because I don't remember him that night. And that's the night that it was the Ride for Dime or the Dime Bag tribute show, mm-hmm. whatever. In nineteen or two thousand and six or seven, it was like Battle Cross, Soldiers of Str- Scrape, um, Till I, um, which was, um, and what was that one band from that Donnie Spears? You know Donnie Spears. Oh, oh gosh, shit. I know his. Yeah, I know. Real handsome guy. Yeah, my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your buddy. He helps you out with uh, doing stuff at your house and yeah, stuff. Sometimes, I, yeah, merch. Then, and... then, then we kind of had a split over the political shit. Oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah. No, but we're cool. I love you, Donnie Spears. Yeah. Okay. We just don't like Trump. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And um. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna make her spit. Up, making her spit I up wine. almost came out of my nose. That's funny. Um. But his band was there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and um. And, oh, and that's the night I fucking met Tara Hunt, who ended up getting Mike together Kriegers. with Mike Krieger. Yeah. That, that was just a fucking nightmare. Right on. Um, and and Miss Ashley West. That's the night I met them, and I and I saw Battle Cross for the first time, mm-hmm. and I was blown away. And I was like, you know, Dan, you gotta, you know, he at the time Dan was in this shitty fucking band who was good at the time, but they're assholes. So they his band. As they sleep, who isn't doing shit now? Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I don't care if they. Is that I, Nick I, Morris's I, yeah, old yeah, band? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll still talk shit about them. Fuck that's them. Fine, I don't that's care. Fine. Okay. Anyways, um, they shared um, space with Battlecross at the loft. And Dan one time took me up there to hang out because they shared space. It was their practice space, too. So. Um, I went up there and we hung out with them and whatever, whatever. And, you know, I I was trying to, you know, like Dan. So I was doing whatever, you know, with him to impress him or whatever. And then... You mean a good girlfriend? Yeah, I was a good yeah, girl. Yeah. Right and um, so he was just like, you know, I think you're awesome. You do all this awesome shit. Um, you should manage Battlecross. This band is going to be awesome. This band is going to blow up if they just had somebody that you know, knew what to do with them. And I was like, I don't know what to do with them, but okay. You know what I mean? So like, you know, we told the band and they're like, okay. And you, you, so you started managing a band to impress. Oh a guy yeah. Yeah. Oh, liked. that's totally known. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> and so now known. nine years later. Right. No, everybody like, knows that. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And they never, I make ideas happen. I don't come up with the ideas. I make them happen. That's always been true of everything that I've ever done. So what, what's that? Say that again. So like, it's somebody that comes up with the idea and I make it happen. Okay, you're the yeah, implementer, not I, the not the visionary. Yeah, yeah. I have okay. no creativity whatsoever. Bull. Yeah. Anyway, c- okay. continue. Anyway, so he told the band. <laughs> the band thought it was kind of weird, but had me there, and I just kind of went there and did exactly what I have done, what I would do, because at the same time I was sitting on uh, as a board member on the Plymouth Canton Schools Educational Foundation, the the school district foundation that raises money for the school district mm. and I was a board member and I was then at that time leading them through the strategic planning process and I know that sounds you know whatever but that's what I do no and um you're a strategist uh, yeah yeah exactly and um so all I did was I mean the only thing I knew how to do was to sit down with the band with these big newsprint things on the wall in writing strategies and goals and objectives, just like I would for the the you know the the board. And that was the first meeting that you had with them, like yeah. the first big band meeting. Yeah, that was the first big band meeting, and we, and, and we called it the Toe Plan, the Strategic Plan, the Take Over the World Plan. Yeah, I, I, and I'm, it's perfect that we're getting into it right now because I want you to tell our audience about the first big meeting you had with Battle Cross, at which you laid out the game plan for the future and some of the legitimate concerns you had when getting started with them. Oh well, some of the 
you know, concerns. That, I mean, the, of course, the biggest concern was I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, "Let's wing it." And but I, but I knew I was very good at building relationships and, you know, figuring out things. And you know, that's exactly, you know, my concern also because you know I had little two kids at home. But how I was going to learn it all? But I knew how I was going to learn it all. I just was kind of fretting at the fact that it was going to take so long because I, you know, I knew I was going to have to immerse myself in the industry somehow and not get paid, and figure it out. Right. So, but. You know, it was also coming at a time where my nonprofit career was getting kind of weird and I was wanting to step away from it. And um, so I was just ready for my new adventure because every five to ten years I'm ready for a new adventure. Yeah, you know, right on. A new industry, a new something or other to learn, from, build up from the bottom up and just, just do it to see if I can. Why do you think that is? Why do you desire a new adventure every half, half a decade or so? I just think that it's that gifted ADHD smart chick thing where it's like I want to do you get bored with succeeding at something and say it's this is it's too easy for me to succeed now now I have to move on no I mean I don't say it's too easy to succeed but there is a boredom factor at times um I just I I just want um I just have this you know inherent I don't know drive that I've always had my whole life I think it's something that's comes from being from Flint Michigan where you're always trying harder and harder and harder, wanting to achieve more and trying to master something. I don't know if it's mm. you know an internal drive or a, a fear of being broke. I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's that's that's called death ground. Okay. I've talked about it on the podcast before, but it's like when you when you feel like you know it, I have to do this or I'm going to die, then you're going to do it. You're going to find a way. Yeah. You're going to survive. And if yeah, if it's the thing of being broke, you know, it's going to drive you. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I think that was one of the things about data is because I really wanted to make the right decisions because to tell you the truth, I really needed money, you know, because <laughs> I was making, you know, hundred grand plus a year in the nonprofit world, and then when I started, you know, I remember you went battle cross. I was like making twenty grand a year. It was y- fucking hard. Yeah, and sorry if I'm swearing. No, no, shit, piss cock. No, it. <laughs> it, it uh, it's funny that you say that too because I remember you for a minute there you were waiting tables again. Weren't well, you? Yeah, there was a couple of times where I did go back to where I went to school at and to, you know, I waited, you know, maybe two weekends where I needed to hustle up some money. But that speaks to your humility because, Fuck. no, <laughs> so, no, honest to God, it does. And I'm going to get you more wine in a second. Thank you. But it, it speaks to your humility in the sense that you just said I was making $100,000 a year and I went down to a fifth of that yeah. plus having kids, yeah. you know, and be, building this business from the ground up and everything. Yeah, but... That uh, that doesn't just speak to your humility, but also your sacrifice, because a lot of people in that position would choose comfort and ease over hardship and struggle. And so, but you saw something at the end of going through that hardship and struggle that made it worth it. Not and not just from a monetary standpoint, like oh yeah, I'm, it's going to suck now, but I'm going to be rich getting this band made. That wasn't the no. intent. It was a thing of I'm going to help this band together, we're going to team up together and we're going to achieve something great together. And doing that will give me more personal fulfillment than what I'm doing now. Well, I mean, yes. Or am I just projecting? No, no, no. Yes and no. I mean, but the thing was, was like, you know, you say that, you know, it says a lot about me, but you know, equal to that, it says a lot about the band that that early on, I had so much faith in them that I knew that they were going to be something and the type of people that they were, I knew that they were going to be in it with me. So I think it says a lot about the band that, you know, I did put all of my eggs in one basket. So first who, then what? Right. And and then another th- aspect of that that was driving me was I also was in, in a position in my life where there was some change and Dan and I had broken up and all that sort of thing. And it wasn't very pretty. Yeah. You started the, the company with him. Yeah. Um, and you, you guys have an amicable relationship. Now which, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, d- does he still work in any facet on the team with no, you at all? No. It, it, you know. Um, it was more just your name. Yeah. It's, it's Well, it's his name. Right. Faze is right. his name. It just is a cool name. But um, he, it was just pretty much his idea, and he would just show up at shows. I mean, he didn't do anything else other than that, you know. I mean, he gave me a lot of backgroundy stuff, you know. Um, but um, so he kind of brought you back into the metal world yeah. fold, mm-hmm. encouraged you to go after something that needed going after, and yeah. just went, "All right, cool." Because I, I, 
I didn't know that. I, I was under the impression that you guys started it out as a team. And then we, you... Well, you know, we kind of did because it was his idea and he was the one that was, you know, I mean, I didn't know who was on what label at that time. Sure, yeah, sure. I was so out of it, but he would tell me, you know, and we would go to, you know, festivals and it helped with my credibility as this, you know, 30 something year old mom there at the metal show where he's sitting there going, yeah, man, I loved your fucking work on work, you know, <laughs> uh, sounds of perseverance, man. You know what I mean? So, it, you know. It brought some, you know, level of credibility, but you know, it was important to do all of that stuff too, and 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 do this because I, I was in that position after Dan and I had broken up, that I needed. And my life had started all over again. I needed to be able to show my daughters. You know what I mean? That you can leave any situation and start all over again and start from the ground up and do it. So it's like I had, you know, the financial pressure to succeed, and I also had, just the, you know ethical, moral, motherly, you know. You want to be the to, example. Yeah, I have to be a good example. Yeah. You know? Right on. So that was important. I met your kids. They're cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've been over them. Oh, to me and you watching movies, Amadeus. That's right. Fucking best movie in the world. Eating Thanksgiving leftovers and drinking mm-hmm. two bottles of wine. Uh, so who all is on the team now? Is it just still just you? I know you, Jana. Me. I have Jana. Jana is still with me. Excellent. Um, hey, she, Jana. Hi, Jana. I love you. She's great. She is doing. She does the day to day for Black Fast. Black Fast is her battle cross. Beautiful. And um, you know she handles that. And um, you know I do the bigger stuff. The you know reach talk to the label and the reach out to other managers and agents and that sort of thing. But you know she's awesome. She's she's you know she's the version of me. You know the. She's the Chicago version of Elda. You know, just <laughs> that's right. She's in Chicago now. You know. um, I want to go back to the meeting again, and I want to I want to get a little bit more detailed. Okay. Because there are musicians and bands and artists that listen to this podcast, hi and there. what's that? I just wanted to say hi to them. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, and I think it would shock or surprise some of them to hear how the first meeting went and the truths about here's what it's going to take here's what you're going to have to sac- give up in order to you know to go up that mm-hmm. type of thing what uh take put them in the room with you like flies on the wall what do you talk what are you discussing with Battlecross? how does this meeting go i want to spend i want to spend a little time on this because i want bands to, i think that bands should it's so hard for artists to think about the business side of things because they they get told by other ho- doubters and naysayers and haters or their peers or whatever that oh that's selling out man just make the music it's, it's supposed to be about having fun making music man and one day you know you're in the right place at the right time and someone sees you bang you get signed it doesn't work like no, that anymore it doesn't it doesn't it so doesn't work like that. i want i want you because you're an you're a guest of mine that is in a unique position okay to tell artists what it's really like and what it's really going to take in 2017 to go to the next level, not 1967 or 1977. Uh, well, I mean, what I'm going to say, they're not going to like. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's it, The truth will set you free, everybody, but first it might piss you off. Yeah, well, even if when I say this and you even have one inkling or doubt, you know, like, oh, my God, I can't do that, then it's not for you. But um, and, and, and it happened at the first meeting with the boys and I, uh, you know, this comes first. Before family, before jobs, before our children, whatever, this comes first. Because when this happens, then everything else, you know, mm-hmm. falls into place. Correct. And, um, you Correct. know, I, the boys, and, and they've lived like it. You know, they have missed, you know, kids' birthdays. You know, Tony, I remember we were scheduling his wedding around whether or not we were going to get a follow-up tour with Metallica after Orion or Mayhem Fest, um, you know, funerals, uh, you know, even when, you know, Don, um, uh, you know, when his girlfriend died. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say that, but, you know, I what? mean, you were on the phone with, I mean, you had I, him on the Yeah, on I the talked air. with Don. Yeah, but I mean, we, we were playing a festival the day that we buried her <laughs> and... We called the festival where he had an agent called the festival and they switched our times so we could, you know, bury her and drive straight to the festival. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, there nothing, nothing stops us. And, and, and that's very important. And if, if anybody can't make that commitment or sacrifice, then or even has a second thought after hearing that, then that's not for them. But that was, you know, one of the things that we 
decided upon. And did you talk? And, and I'm safe in assuming. Well, I'm not safe in assuming. I know you talked about a long term strategy. Oh yeah. How far out? How far out of a? Uh, you know, did you paint a picture of a year out, three years well, out, five years well, out? What we did was we did a, you know a long. What what is you know a five year strategy? What do we? Where do you want to be in five years? And I think it was we want to play with Metallica and um, play with Metallica and play Mayhem Fest. And I was like, well, what the fuck? You know, we're never going to, you know, that's going to, wow. Okay, well, what do we need to do to get there? Mm -hmm. So what needs to happen after year one? Where do we need to be there? Where do we have to be after year two? Da, 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 da. So, you know, we took that overall long-term goal of five years and, you know, then, oops, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Where do we need to be in each year? Okay, well, we need to get these tours. We need to get this. We need to get signed here. We need to get, you know, even... um, quantify it like how many and this was at this time we need to get up to 30,000 MySpace fans MySpace fans yeah. okay that's where I met you as MySpace you, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I met you through MySpace maybe I, yeah. I'm gonna guess it was Facebook but I could be wrong no Either it was way. MySpace I remember that's, your MySpace page that's funny yeah gosh I hope no, I hope you're the only one that remembers my MySpace page. <laughs> um, that's funny um, so you talked I'm about a long term sure. strategy and did you discuss did you did you discuss or hone in on the core values of the group? Yeah, we did. We did have some strategic values, um, and well, that was one of them. I already you know busted it out, saying that you know this comes first. Sacrifice, and that it was that we also agreed that we were going to do everything the right way. Define and the right way. The right way is not ever cheating. Okay. Like when like we like buying Facebook likes well, and yeah, followers. Well, no, and things like well, that. I mean, yeah, but. You know, no, because I mean, we run ads for Facebook lights. And well, ads, like is, ads is one but thing. But we meant doing the right thing. One thing that I have always believed in and how I lived in my life is that I always do the right thing, even if it's the hard thing. Okay. Sometimes but if it's the, the right, right thing, thing is the hard thing. Yeah. You know, and well, it's always usually the hard thing. <laughs> and um, and the thing is, is that, okay, like we're always going to do everything the right way. So not only is it the right thing to do because we're all good people, but two, doing the right thing also gives you the data to make good decisions. For instance, let's say we're on tour and um, our merch cut for the venue is 20%. Well, we don't tell the venue we only made 500 bucks, so we could just give them ten $100. Right. We're going to tell them the truth, and in our books it says it, because we use software that you know shoots an email to the promoter that says how much you know we made, whatever. Right. Um, we're going to say $1,000. And we'll pay them that extra $100 because not only is it good for our record keeping and make decisions to know what we made in each venue and each whatever, but also it tells the promoter how much money we can pull in. So that when our agent, you know, calls around for a headliner next time or something like this, you know, next tour, he knows that he can get away with this higher guarantee because he knows that we sell this amount of merch and he's going to get an extra 300 bucks, you know, or 400 bucks right. from the merch. You know what I mean? So... You know, why why take away that perception and why take away those opportunities and, you know, just to make a, you know, to just keep it 20, 30 bucks, dollars. you know, to yeah. keep 20, 30 bucks. It's right. not worth it. So, and another thing is, you know, just doing the right thing, um, you know, when we're on tour, well, it's 90% cash, you know, 80% cash. We could fudge the numbers. We don't yeah, do that, you right. know, because then how do I make financial decisions later? How do I give them a goal next time we're on tour, right. telling them how much they need to bring in? Yeah, you if know? your reports aren't accurate, then right, you can't exactly. make accurate decisions. Exactly. So I, you You're know, all the money, yeah, all the, you know, who wants to keep a, two sets of books or whatever? I mean, the bands don't Al probably. Capone. Yeah, well, <laughs> right, I guess. Right. But, you know, bands don't even keep books, but, you know, I want to make sure that all the money goes in. Nobody's cheating, you know what I mean? And, right. Uh, you know. Right. So we have the data to make decisions. Sorry, it gets boring. That's not talking about that. That's not boring at all. So do it's, the right thing, bands. Yeah. Okay. Well, to that point, give me three examples of how artists get in their own way. Be it, and that that was a good one. And that's mm-hmm. that one's way more subtle. But are there are there any examples of of how you commonly see? And I don't want to say local bands because, quite frankly, local bands are just bands that haven't toured. So bands in general. How do artists, musicians, bands? get in their own way on a regular basis mistake uh, you know a couple mistakes that they make time and time again or a principle that they're violating well you know the biggest principle that they're violating i'm sorry to interrupt you no we're talking the the biggest principle that they're violating is by putting other things ahead of the band putting what other things ahead of the band okay you know what i mean that's one thing is that they're not treating the band like a business and i had a conversation with uh, uh, olavi um 
Oli from uh, Amon Amarth was when... That's the band that plays with the front of a Viking ship on yeah, stage, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And he and I had a long talk about that. And he's like, we, Velda, he, you know, he really admire, you know, we admire each other. We like each other a lot. And sometimes I go see them on tour and he and I will sit and chit chat and whatever. I met him on Mayhem Fest and um, he sits down and says to me, you know, we didn't make it as a band. We didn't figure this out until we decided this was how we were going to make our money. This was going to come first, that we were going to give everything else up and make this be the way that I make, you know, we made money. And you know, he said, you know, we see that Battlecross is already doing that. We see that you're doing that. And that was a good, you know, a good move. And so when you put everything else aside and make it secondary and make this be the one, you know, the thing that, you know, you will put every effort into it. Just like I said right. earlier, all that data I collected, all that hard work that I did is because I needed to survive. Mm-hmm. That was the only way I was going to be able to make it survive. Right on. And so that's a principle that that I think local bands are letting it get away. Oh, I can't go. It's my kid's birthday party, you know, and things like that. Or my job, whatever. Fuck your job. If you want to be a musician, you. this is how Thank it's got to be. And I know you do think the same way. I do. And another thing is, is that when you have somebody like me, I don't want to say like me, but anybody right. who has been there and has done that and is offering advice and all the people that hit me up and, you know, my inbox on Facebook blows up like you wouldn't even know of every band wanting my advice or every band wanting to send me their shit. What could I do? And I'll send them like, here is a Google Analytics. Um, here's a Google Analytics two week training an hour a day to learn how to use Google Analytics and to get that data. And here's a Facebook training on this, this and that. They want a quick answer. They want a quick result. They don't want to do the work to figure it out. I worked many, many years and not gotten paid to figure all this shit out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to just give that to you. Mm -hmm. You need to figure it out because you need to be able to get the information that is needed to push your band and to make the right decisions. And this is how you do it. And they don't take advantage of it, assholes. Uh, You know, it's funny because... They reach out to you, yeah, and you give them the information that they're asking for, and they don't like it, and that because it doesn't jive with what they expected because or what, it's not or what, easy. right? Yeah, they think it's something simple. Right. It is simple, hard work, exactly, and Practice, money, and money. learning. All right, okay. Instead of going and partying with all these people who are buying that ounce weed, take the hundred fifty dollars and do an amazing Facebook. You know, where are you getting an ounce of weed for one hundred fifty? Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I got to find that person. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's anyway. possible. No, but seriously, just go ahead. But, you know, it's like, you know, or don't do this, this, and that, or why buy that, you know, whatever, whatever that you're buying for your ridiculous car or something. Right. Um, take that money and put it into Facebook ads, yeah. and, and I'll even look at your campaign and pick your targets and choose your image, you know. Right. Don't pay me the hundred, you know, $50 right now. Let me just show you, to, you know, don't waste it use it right you want to get bigger and you want to get audience you want to get a label to look at you well the label's not gonna look at you when you have 400 likes right right if you really want it then put this money in there so you can have 4,000 likes or 14,000 likes but a lot of these and again the, the, not even again a lot of these cats are probably i'm assuming though they're they're hitting you up because they they want to achieve some some modicum of success and as a band or as an artist or whatever but but it's like you say all that, and it's hey, get okay, get after it. Then here's here's what to do. Right. Here's what I right. did. Get after it. Learn this, and it's like do this, and and essentially, it's like you're kind of throwing that out there. Like if you do this and show me that you're doing this, mm-hmm. I'm offering you this free advice, right. and so many people don't take it. Right. But if you take it and come back to me and said, hey, I did that thing. Right. I have another question. That you're makes, happy to answer that yeah, question. Yeah, and that makes and keep, me interested. You know what I mean? That makes right. me, I mean, not so interested that I might take them on, but interested that I'll, you know, pay some sort of attention or, or you know, or when, when Battlecross plays a token show and we're looking for, open, or John's looking for openers and I'll say, oh, well, right. this band works hard, this one. Right. But, but the ones that ask me and hound me for advice and want the quick answers, well, guess what? When they're hitting up, you know, the token to open, John gives me the list and I'm like, fuck these guys, fuck these guys, fuck and I these felt, guys. And I felt like one of those assholes with you for a brief period no. in our relation. I know, I know, but this is this is the, the, the self-loathing artist in me that's like, oh, I, she probably... Because th- I've hit you up for advice on times and I try not to abuse that privilege, obviously, but... 
I was taking, no, you're, you're okay. The two bands that I was in when I was coming to you for advice, yeah. I would take that advice back to them yeah, but they would. and they would tell me why it wouldn't work right, or why right. they wouldn't work right. for it. Right. Um, and then the other time I introduced you to one of the band, yeah, yeah. the band that I was playing with and you met with them and, and it seemed like of, things yeah. like were fine. But, but again, it was, you know, well, she's got a lot of good ideas, but I don't think they'll yeah, work yeah. for us. It's it, like, yeah. it, you know. It, and they let it slide. And on top of that, they hit me up afterwards and wanted to tour Fast Cross after you left. And I after like, I left? Yeah. I was like, no. You know, you know. My, my, I was, you know, I love them and everything. They're a great band and they're fun. But it was you that made me, you know. Here's the a, here's a deal. Here's the deal. I want to be a part of What it. I've learned since that ended is I found my core values after that ended. I didn't know what my core values were. Oh, interesting. I did not know what my core values were until right before that ended when I, um, Jim Doyon from Ink Addict. Uh-huh. If you, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. He hit me to the book that helped him take his business to the stratosphere. Uh-huh. And I started reading it. And the first thing it has you do is define your core yeah, values. Exactly. Every business, everything has to have a set of values that you guys live by and will operate on. Aw, sacrifice, uh, measurable growth, absolutely accountability. Yep. Reputation for excellence, uh, uh, reputation, perception. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, time, intensity, respect. Yeah. Those are smarter. Yeah. Smarter. Yeah. No, that's those are good goals. And those are good values. And, that's and if you a, yeah. everything that you do has to reflect those values. Correct. And that will be, you know, one of the things that you look at when you make decisions. Mm-hmm. They guide does it, all the does decisions. Does it meet the data? And does it abide by your core values? And that's important in any business, not music. Because if you think that we're talking bullshit now, it's you know, that's not the that's not the case. Every business, every company, every corporation is guided not only by their strategy, but by this, by their set of goal values or core values. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that, but it, what's funny is even though the core values that I define for myself are the, are the same core values for the band, that's because it's my band, it's my music, and I want to surround myself with people that operate the way I do. Right. Um, I... I've done the whole, you know, form a band with friends and have it be a democracy thing, but a band is not a democracy. It's a group of individuals with diverging ambitions who have agreed right. to make music together for a while. Right. And unless you have a vision and define your values as a group, you know, if you're doing that, then, you, yeah. So yeah. I'm I, so lucky. And just you saying that, and I hear the horror stories of other bands, I'm just so lucky that my first experience, even though it's, you know, so different than probably any other band that you know, I would ever work with or every other band out there. But I was so lucky to have my first band mm. be the set of young men that, you know, I call my brothers. Yeah. And, Cross. and you're right in that sense. But they wouldn't have been your first band. You're, you're okay. I'm going to posit this. Your first band was always going to be a band like Battlecross, yeah. even if it wasn't Battlecross, because their values yeah. jive with your values. Exactly. Okay. If you sat down with them and their values didn't jive, they wouldn't have been your yeah. first band. We just wouldn't have worked together. Right. And oh, maybe you wouldn't yeah. have done this. But because right. you found a band or, or worked with a band first that that matched your values, yeah. that then gets other bands that, you know, interested in you, like your Crimson Shadows, like your Black yeah. Fast. They look, to- at, they look at what's going on with Battlecross and, and the type of dudes they are. Right. And, then, and then they see the type of woman you are. And they get it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they're bought in already. You don't right. have to sit at that meeting and convince right. them to, to buy in. They're bought in before they go to the meeting. And right. now they're just hungry and ready right. to start working. Because they, too, were looking for people that had those same core values. Yes. And, and that's, that's why I don't have 50,000 bands. Because there's been lots of big bands that have come to me. But I'm particularly choosy. And I may not ever have another band again. Okay. That leads to my next question. So. Uh, <laughs> I need to have a cigarette soon. You can smoke in here. I will allow it. Really? 100%. Would you have allowed anybody else or is it just me? I, just you. <laughs> just you, Zelda. Are you sure? Let's open a window. Yeah, we will okay. open a window. All Absolutely. Right. Well, next question. Um, yeah. Uh, from the Phase Facebook page, uh-huh. uh, quote, not currently open to new artist management clients. Yeah. Why not? Because to do the best that you can for a band... And put every effort that they deserve because I am charged with developing and maintaining their careers. That's something I take very seriously. And that requires a full-time job for every band. That's why I have three artists. Because I literally think that when the bands are active, Mm. Battlecross has been more than a full-time job. Mm. I mean, I've put in plenty of 18-hour days on on 
on that band. I've seen it. And, you know, I see so many managers and artists, or managers that have, you know, 15, 20 bands on their roster. How the fuck can you manage the careers of 15 or 20 bands? And Is do, it just them, or do, do they the have a team? Well, they may have, like, you know, maybe somebody doing day-to-day stuff or whatever, but they don't have 15 other people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I hear from bands all the time, and the boys hear from other bands all the time, mm. that they're kind of envious or whatever, because, you know, I'm so involved with them, or I'm so whatever, and they, like, we've never even fucking met our manager. You know? That's disgusting. Yeah. That's disgusting. Well, so, you know, that's the industry. Well, could Jana handle more than one artist? Uh, not trying to put her on the spot. Yeah, I mean, just... yes, yeah, she could. And she's helped me here and there with some other bands, you know, that I was trying to launch or I did launch or whatever. But, uh, you know, I want her to put every effort into Blackfast in the same way that I put Battlecross because they're a fantastic band. Right. And it's going to take the same amount of effort that I put into Battlecross for them to take off. So I want her every effort in there. Who? who uh, I talk too fast. N- no, you should. Honey, I'm Mexican. Who are you talking to right here? I'm Mexican. No, you're gifted. You're a genius. Okay. No. I got skipped ahead of grade in school too. I did. Uh, we, you and I had the same school. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. What grades? Had, what grades did you? I skipped. Uh, I was in kindergarten for three weeks at four years same old. Same thing. And they moved me into first grade. Same thing. And then at the end of first grade, I went to second grade. No. You've oh, earned okay. it. You've earned it. Yeah, I'm gonna be drunk driving home. So Don't do that. Good. Yeah. So I drive a, for Uber. You can pay me. Can Can I put that over there so I can have a smoky smoke? Yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Um. Are, are you open to any non-metal artists in the future? Are, you worked with the one from New York City. What was her name? Megan Wright? Yeah, Megan. But that was a partnership between Steve Davis and our agent at the time, um, Tim Bohr from the agency group. And, and uh, you know, Tim was working in the capacity where he was trying to be manager, too, when he was an agent. And it just was too many, you know, chiefs and... It just, you know... Sure. Divided and, leadership. And the, yeah, and these were three people that were totally immersed in the metal world. Okay. You know, Tim being a longtime, you know, agent for Guar and Hatebreed and Danze and Killswitch Engage and Battlecross and mm. whatever. And Steve Davis is the manager of all these big, huge, you know, bands. Uh, you know, we're in the metal world. And here we are, have a singer-songwriter. And, um, you know, just, uh, you know, she's a great artist and stuff like that. But it just wasn't... Uh, wasn't the right fit for all three managers to try to manage her career in the right way, but um, but but that leads to that question is like being open to other artists. Um, you know, it took me years and years and years, truthfully, to learn the industry and make these relationships. If I were to switch over to another genre, it would take me another years and years and years to learn that industry and learn really? that genre. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And even though, the, as far as the business side and the marketing and all that sort of thing, sure, I could do the hell out of that. But um. But um. You know, half the job is the relationships. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Are you sure I can smoke in here? I'm positive. I'm Where's not... an ashtray? Uh, I got one right here. Okay. How is that Kevin Hart book? Uh, it, the Kevin Hart autobiography, yeah. co-written with Neil Strauss, one of my favorite authors right. of all time, uh-huh. uh, is fantastic. Okay, good. It, um, I'll tell you what. I, I read actively yeah. these days. It's one of the things I do, and I highlight as I go through things that are relevant to me. If it doesn't work for you, it's pure entertainment. Right. So, oh, hey, I read a book. No, I want something that works for me. Like you said, manage your resources wisely. Right. I have so many books on my shelves all over the house. They got highlights in them and all that stuff. But I told myself I didn't need to buy another book, but I did. But it's all about life lessons. Oh, good. He's the most successful stand-up comedian in the world right now. He's selling out football stadiums. Of, really? Yes, Kevin Hart. And he's, yeah. he built this. He's Him's, like four feet tall. Right. Sometimes other people's doubt can be the best motivation there is to succeed. Oh, for sure. Without any doubt there. There's another example. What do we got here? Uh, It's never too late to start caring. My future was out there. It was just waiting for me to find it. And the challenge was not to give up on myself just because it seemed like everyone else was pulling ahead of me and leaving me further and further behind in the months that followed. Mm. This is right after he graduated from high school and he didn't go to college and whatever. Uh, uh, so that's, the te- now. that's the test that each of us faces in life. Can you fail and still be strong? Can you not fit in and still accept yourself? Can you lose everything and still keep searching? Absolutely. Can you be in the dark and still believe in the light? Because no matter how low you go and how lost you feel, there is always tomorrow. And tomorrow just may be the day when you get lifted up and find your way. There is just one thing that tomorrow demands of you to make this happen, that you never stop believing in your power to create a better day. This way, when your best possible future comes looking for you, almost always at a time, in place you least expect it you will be able to recognize its face and respond to its call word up kevin hart hell yeah kevin hart hell yeah so 
Yeah. When my favorite author writes a book, I buy it. And the fact that it's the most successful stand-up comedian working today. And there, this is the other thing with stand-up comedy. I find that I don't even listen really to music anymore. Yeah. I listen to podcasts and sports talk radio. Oh. And when I watch TV, I watch stand-up comedy and sports. Huh. The stand-up comedians are like the truth tellers right now. For I'm sure. going somewhere with this. Yeah, yeah. Music in the 60s and 70s was speaking to social change right and on. that's what helped, you know, fuel the hippies, you know, peace and love and all that stuff. Right and on. then when MTV came out and it all became about the hit and the single and all that stuff right. and it's the music video that completely shifted everything over from the album to the single albums got killed when they started charging 18.99 for a cd that only had one two songs on it blah 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 but music has become less and less and less about truth and more and more and more about sales oh yeah and, for sure. and uh celebrity um and because the tools to make music are so much uh, the, the digital stuff is now at a point where it rivals the analog yeah. and the cost to acquire it is so low that anyone can jump in the game at this point. For sure. Right? But, so, because, yeah. but, because, but because of that, everyone's trying to make that hit and that, you right. know, it's so hard to rise above the, the noise to be the signal. Um, what I'm getting at is the songs that battle cross rights. Oh, I've, yeah. I'm glad that you're touching on this. Are all about becoming a better human being. Right. Leaving shittiness behind. Yes, le yes, yes. As my mother would say, uh, accentuating the positive, eliminating the negative. Right. That's that's the the mindset. But that's not just what comes out in the lyrics. It's also how you guys operate that's as right. a group. And that's one of our core values. Okay, and that's what Kevin Hart is just talking about right. you know it's you know you are where you are today because of the decisions you made yesterday yep. likewise tomorrow is a result of today's decision Amen. so if you want a better tomorrow make better decisions today, today. and know that you own right. that the power to make those decisions and the only way that you can do that is with the plan and core values correct you have goals. to have a vision yeah and that was the first right. meeting that you had with battlecross was right. unpacking that vision the first meeting that i had with the guys that are playing with me in my band uh-huh we sat around my fire pit right there. We didn't. We hadn't played a note. We never played together in a room. I'd never played music. I, I'd made music with. Um, I've known all of them except for one since I was since I was in high school, basically. Okay, so but I've never really made music with them. But I had a twelve page, and I actually I should email it to you because I think you would greatly appreciate it. I probably would. <laughs> it's uh, a vision slash traction manifesto. Okay. Okay. And where it just outlines the whole vision. It was 12 pages. And I handed a copy out to each of them. And we sat around the fire playing popcorn. You remember playing popcorn in school at I don't all? I think so. The teacher would start reading. And then they would say popcorn and pick a random student. Popcorn, Nicholas. Yeah. And then Nicholas would have to start reading right where the teacher stopped and picked up. And then he would read until he decided he was going to stop and then go popcorn, Sally. Oh. And then Sally would have to read. And if he she didn't, didn't do that. it helped. It, okay. It, the idea was it helped keep everyone on this, literally on the same page and made sure that's, that everyone in the, in the room was paying attention. That's a good idea. We played popcorn with my vision manifesto. 12 right pages. Ahead. It took us two hours to read through it. Well, because we're reading it out loud. We're not just sitting there going, yes, exactly. But we talked about the core values. We talked about our core focus and our purpose, our passion, our niche. Right. We talked about um, our marketing strategy. We talked about our 10-year, uh, our, our big, hairy, audacious goal right. 10 years from now. We talked about our three-year picture. We talked about our one-year plan. We talked about setting quarterly rocks. So we're going to meet a week from uh, this coming Monday, again, around the fire pit to discuss, hey, here's here's the and progress. somebody wrote those down. I did. Okay, good. And then the next time you meet, you talk about how to achieve those. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So when we meet again, we're going to talk about you know, the progress we've made, You know, identify, discuss, and solve our it, any issues that we right. have. Threats. A a threats. <laughs> um, and then set our, our rocks for the next 90 days so that we can be charting progress. Absolutely. So, and I, most bands don't, no. Don't do what you and I no. are talking about doing, no. though. What they just they get together and jam. Right. Hey, let's get together and jam and see what happens. Yeah. I'm, I'm putting this out there. I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before, but I'm putting this out there to my audience right now. One of the quickest ways to get me to be disinterested in making music with you is to ask me to get together and jam. That's right. It is the most boring thing to me. Yeah. It I, doesn't I, lead any, to anything. No. It, no. No. What, hey, we're going to fuck around on our instruments. I'm not 12 anymore. Anyway. Right. Uh, all right. When, when Don was on the podcast, we talked about the hurdles of finding and assimilating a new drummer, you know, from his perspective, because Battlecross has gone through drummers. We talked about this. Um, but from his perspective as a member of the rhythm section, I'd like to hear it from your perspective now. Talk us through your process once 
you get a call from the road and something's gone wrong or you get you get word <laughs> that a member is leaving the you know talk us through your process the emotional toll it takes on you and the band however long or brief and what you what you do as as their manager to keep everything moving in a, forward in a positive direction <sighs> Oh, which part do you want me to answer first? About what happens when they're on the road and some shit comes up? Go. Yeah. Oh, geez. Well, the I mean... I, I heard the van story where they had nine vans in like the course of two weeks. Oh, I, yeah, but that was the whole tour, not just us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, um, well, when something like that happens on the road, a lot of, sometimes now the boys have gotten to the point where they just take care of themselves and don't bother me with it. Um, but when they can't... You know, and in the past, oh, we just blew an axle or, oh, we blah, 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 you know, this, this or that. Then I don't even have any time to react because just our whole purpose is always one of our core values moving forward. Okay, how are we going to fix this and how are we going to get to the next show? Because Battlecross is another core value of never missing shows. We don't miss shows. I think we've missed two. Um, So it's like whatever it takes, another one of our core values. Okay, whatever it takes to get to the next show. Um, so I just go into overdrive working, figuring out how to solve the problem. Um, you know, okay, you need to move everything into this van. Let me call the manager of the other band on tour with you and see if we can use their trailer to get our shit to the next show. Da, 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 da. Okay. And then I'm here. There's a U-Haul right outside of Indianapolis on route 60, whatever, you know, uh, they're expecting you guys, you know, mm. it just goes into full problem solving mode and it could be in the middle of the night on the 4th of July, broken down in Idaho, mm. which has really happened. Mm-hmm. Mayhem Fest 2014. And um, it's, you know, it's review, it's just going back to those core values, Mm. which was, you know, what I just said, whatever it takes, moving forward, whatever, solve the problem and move on. And, um, you know, that's a, that's the same thing that it was with the, um, with the drummer issue. Um, Sure, we'd love to have a permanent drummer. That's the ideal, you know, thing. but not only do you have to be a great drummer, but you also have to be a great person, core value. Right. You know? N- right. No hard drugs, no bullshit stuff, no whatever. Right. I, and you're touching your nose a lot. I, I, no, no, <laughs> it might be the smoke irritating it, okay. but I'm not, not going to admit that that's what it is. <laughs> uh, uh, so, what? Okay. D- so we're fine with having different drummers. You know what I mean? It brings a different element than, you know, we've had some amazing drummers with us. You know, but Adam you're at Pierce. the point now where, where it's happened often. You've been dealing with nine years of fix this headache, fix this problem, solve this issue. Yeah. That every time an issue comes up now, it's like, all right, let's just knock it down. No yeah, problem. I know. Just like any other business, when something comes up, you have to, you can't just lament on it and you can't let it, right. you can't let it let you miss a show or miss a tour. All right, we'll figure it out. Right. Which drummers do we have, you know? And, uh, you know, we have a great drummer now. Uh, Brian, uh, you know, we we met him. Uh, how did we meet him? He was a drum tech for Jason Bittner. Okay. I, I oh yeah. G- yeah. Uh, Shadows Fall. Yeah. I, I don't remember. Why do what, I know this? Shit? Why don't be, <laughs> I, I don't remember because you're a drummer, just like me. I know. I mean, even though I'm not a drummer, I know every drummer that you know, whatever. Thanks right. to Dan. But um, uh, I think that's how we met him, and uh, you know, we've had some amazing drummers: Adam Pierce, Shannon Lucas. Um, uh, you know, um, Kevin Alex. Talley. Um, we had Alex, yeah. And those were fantastic drummers that filled the need that we had at those times. And that was fine. And, it, and it's been great. I think it's been a good thing for the band because it's brought, you know, uh, fans from the bands that they played with. You know, Black Dahlia fans came out when Shannon was playing. Um, All Shall Parish fans came when, you know, Adam uh, Pierce was playing. Uh, you know, Kevin Talley's been in 15,000 bands. So there's. Mm you know, a lot of his fan base, and it was fun, and it, it was um, a good experience, and it really shows the, um, the it really speaks to the musicianship of, of the band as well, mm. and of the, you know, the artists that we have on, that they can play and accompany such uh, complex music mm. and be fantastic with it, and we still sound great, it, you know. It's, it's like, a credit to Don, too, because, oh, Don, again, being the, rhythm, being the other half of the rhythm section, he's the one who's got to get locked in with the drummer the most. Don is, yeah. Just he's not even human. <laughs> uh, yeah, even my boyfriend, you know, who's not, you know, you know, he loves the heavy metal, but you know, he's more of the, you know, because he's twelve years older than I am, so he's fifty six. But so he came from a different era of metal. Uh, you know, I the tail end of it. You know, he loved the Tesla and the Skid Row and all of those. Oh my God, this wine! <laughs> and um, you know, I took him to a Battlecross show, and uh, you know, he loved it, and he just, you know, saw Don and was just like. 
he looked at me after the show and all he said was that is a bad motherfucker <laughs> and uh, you know i was like i told you he's like i had never imagined a guest in the world i mean he is don slater don he's is, such a righteous dude he's he's uh not even human and it's you know he's so unassuming and so regular and then he plays the bass and then you know and and I've been fortunate enough to be on tour, you know, with them a couple of times, you know, some shows here and there. And you've got every bassist on the tour standing side stage, you know, waiting to suck his dick afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, so currently on the artist roster, Battlecross, Crimson Shadows, Blackfast, and Turbid North? Well, I don't have Turbid North anymore. Oh, shame uh, on me. You well, know, you pr- okay. probably update your goddamn Facebook page then. All right, sorry. <laughs> I will. I don't even, are you talking about the Phase Media page? Yes. Yeah, I should do something with that. That's funny. I forget. See, it's, it's just weird to me that people follow me. Like the other day, I was looking at my Facebook page, and I saw like followers. How many followers? I'm like, why is there? Why are there people following me? So I don't even occur. It doesn't even occur to me to. Hey, speaking of following, are you even really on Twitter? At this I, point, I, I love Twitter. I love Twitter yeah, too. Yeah, I do too. I love I Twitter. I do too. And I manage my boyfriend's Twitter page as a coach. Okay. And, you know, I don't do, uh, you know, the, the Battlecross stuff, uh, you know, I, I need to get back into it. Right now, they're on a little bit of a hiatus. So I, I haven't, I've been slagging. But tonight we have a meeting. I'm sure they'll whip me back into shape and we'll come <laughs> up with a social media plan for this next phase of um, part of the tow plan. But uh, you guys meeting at your place? Yeah. Righteous. Yeah. Righteous. Um, so it's just the, it's the three artists right now. It's yeah, black. and Crimson Shadows is you know they're they're ta- you know to tell you the truth you know they're they're on a hiatus too and just waiting for them to say okay we have a new singer and we're ready for a new record because the label's been you know uh, wanting stuff from them but um, gotcha. you know right now most of my efforts you know are well, with Black Fast and Battlecross. Well, so, so even even speaking with labels, with um, how do you see things changing with labels right now because of the way that the internet has disrupted the industry? I mean. Again, it, I don't know if it's in your purview because you're working in the metal scene, no, but Chance the Rapper, you familiar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. S- Skyrocket. Right, exactly. Killing but it. But that's a different audience. It is a different audience, but but they're consuming the music in a different way. Do, right. uh, do you think that, that metal fans consume music in a very specific way that wouldn't allow uh, an artist like Battlecross or whatever to issue the idea of a quote unquote major or or mid major label in favor of con- controlling their own distribu- distribution, distribution and everything and, and, and owning their own publishing rights and things like that. Yeah, I mean that's an option for us and we've talked about it and we're going to talk about it again tonight because we are in between labels and um Ooh. Yeah, and dun, dun, dun. Yeah, and um but the metal audience is a little bit different than the mainstream and I just had a conversation with this about my son. But um metal artists or metal fans um consume their music in a different uh, in a different way i mean yes there are some overlaps but there's still you know like my kids don't have one cd no my kids don't have any cds and they listen to chance the rapper and all that stuff and that is the age group that listens to that you know you don't listen you know people in their 30s and 40s and you know what i mean they're not into the music that it's not that's now i'm trying I'm tr- I'm tr- I'm trying not from a sense that like I want to fit in. I'm trying from a sense of studying as a, as a producer and and as a, a culturist. Like I force myself to listen. Like I, I'm about to get a Spotify premium account and I'm going to start listening to a lot more music because I realize I don't really listen to music, but I listen to this playlist called Rap Caviar. A lot of it sucks. Yeah. A lot of it really sucks. But I can see why today's generation likes right. this stuff and I'm but and it again if it doesn't work for you it's pure entertainment I'm not really being entertained by this stuff I'm listening okay what are the common elements among this music that is that people are latching onto because what I do for my music mm-hmm. you know about me no uh, what I do is I take different genres and styles and I marry them together and make pop songs right so I call it progressive pop music well mm-hmm. pop in a sense means popular so okay if this is what's going on that's popular I sorry I would like to be popular and you know right. then I don't need to be famous or whatever I, I want I want to be popular. Right. So I'm going to draw from different pop music elements and take what works for my music and apply it and what doesn't work and throw it away. So I'm trying to understand, you know, because if, if I was in Battle Cross, okay, knowing myself, I'd be thinking, okay, what are what are other genres are doing? What is what is the music industry right. as a whole? Oh, here comes a thunderstorm. Beautiful. Oh, awesome. Yep, beautiful. Finally, the salon, we needed rain. Anyway, yeah. um, so... I was yeah, I was wondering if if you're looking at you know the way that things are going now and seeing you know I, what what changes you know how do you view 
what you're going to be doing, you know, in the, in the next one or two well, years to be different than how you started, I guess, you um, know, how are well, you navigating these new waters? I, I mean, I'm always looking at research and, you know, I'm always looking, you know, pulling up, uh, you know, research on the music industry. There's, you know, two websites that I subscribe to and love. It's called Next Big Sound and what's the other one? Um, Next Big Sound and shit. Next Big Sound. Well, there's another one. They're both analytics websites that you put in your information. It links to your Spotify, your Facebook, your Instagram, your rap, your Rhapsody, your Pandora, everything. And it gives you data on your YouTube views and who your audience is, how many streams you've had, uh, how many people are, uh, are starting or subscribing Battlecross channels on Pandora, whatever, whatever. And going back to the question that you were asking, and it ties into this, is about the overlap of, you know, how Chance the Rapper's putting out music and how metal bands are putting out music is that, you know, metal fans consume their music in a little bit of a different way, but you, as an artist, need to use that data and need to collect the data to find out how your fa- who your fans are and how they're accessing your music, how they heard about you, whatever, whatever, like that, so that you can know where they're going to listen to music, so that you can... Make sure your music's there. You can advertise there, et cetera, and use that data to make decisions. And, you know, I know that sometimes I'm a nerd and sometimes the boys kind of get pissy with me that I'm putting out surveys to learn about fans. I'm learning out, okay, do you have Pandora accounts? Do you have paid subscriptions to this, this, and this? So that then that tells me how they're getting their music. I even ask them, do you own our album? Where did you get it? In what format? Mm. And a lot of them still say they buy CDs. When the boys are on the road, I mean, when the boys start a tour, I start with, you know, ordering 500 CDs from the label because they're still selling 20, you know, CDs a show. Mm. But Chance the Rapper, I'm not, they're not selling any CDs at the show. Right. You know? Do you so, I mean, just looking at that, yeah, there are things that I learn and they are best practices. And, you know, and when you say, ask me if what I'm going to be doing in the next, you know, whatever, uh, you know, moving forward, you know, I, and John and I have had this discussion, but it's still very expensive and we still have to figure it out, whatever it takes, is that, you know, we need to boost our efforts in, in our advertising, our marketing, our engagement on streaming. Okay. Where do you find that you uh, get the most traction online from Battlecross fans? Oh, geez. Well, I mean, our fans uh, are mostly on Facebook. And, um, you know, we are getting a lot of traction on Pandora when I'm looking at their plays. You know, they're getting still 20,000, 30,000 plays you know, a week. Uh, you know, it could be better. Um, on and, Bandcamp? No, on um, oh, Pandora. I'm sorry. And so I'm seeing that those numbers increase, you know, and I look over time historically that n- their streams on Pandora, their streams on Sp- Spotify are increasing mm-hmm. so that I need to spend, and I take that data to make the decision that I need to spend more in those spaces. Sure, sure. And metal has, un- unless it's a kitschy cover or a holiday one-off or, or some, sort of, some sort of special support, the troops compilation or whatever, Metal music is mostly, it revolves around the album. Yeah, uh, right? yeah absolutely. Do you Not for, the single, yeah. Do you foresee a situation with how ubiquitous recording technology is now uh, and how available it is? Um, and not only that, but how saturated really the Detroit area is with quality engineers and not my studio by any means. I'm, I'm in my house here. We're in, a, we're like in the second it. bedroom. It's, it's, it's nice. quaint. It works. But do you ever see, especially since you're quote unquote in between labels now or whatever, you you are kind of holding your future in your hands because if you go to another label and sign a contract, hey, we're under contract and now you know there are rules and regulations that are governing how we operate as a band. Do you ever foresee Battlecross just you know throwing out a new single every other month instead and maybe doing like an EP a year instead yeah. of going for a full fledged <laughs> album and everything? Tony and I were just talking about that. Tony came over to bring me a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and Here we, you just, go, we were out in the par- out in my driveway just chatting about these things and I'm like let's wait till Thursday but yeah those are things because you know we have record label offers right now that we're sitting on and that were sent to us you know months ago and that we're still sitting on and um, you know and then I did the math as to what it would cost us and how much money more money we'd make if we'd self-release but then we need to sit there and you know think about you know distribution in Europe and you know PR and how much that's going to add to the cost and marketing and whatever whatever so, you know, those are conversations that we've had. And um, 
there aren't very med- many artists that have done it and done it successful self-release. Um, what was the band that did it and did okay? I can't remember. But there are so many platforms now that can help you with it, you know, a pledge artist or whatever. Patreon? Have yeah. you, are you familiar with that I've at all? heard of it. Yeah. And, it's basically uh, subscription-based crowdsourcing. So instead of doing yeah. a, a one-off Kickstarter or GoFundMe campaign or yeah, whatever. It's, it's constant. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's what I'm doing with my... But, stuff yeah five bucks a month but i but our audience are you know our audience it really isn't that you know what i mean our audience is you know yes we do have probably you know 40 percent of our our audience is you know 18 to 25 you know that's great a good person that's great a a good portion you know because this all the the bands in their 30s yeah oh yeah so to have a millennial audience yeah with thrash metal in 2017, to be 40%, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, we have a good portion of that side, but we also have a good portion that come to shows and buy merch and buy right. albums. Right. And, you know, those record sales really count in metal. And, you know, sure. is that, you know, they're 35 to, you know, or 28 to 35 or 35 mm. to 44. I mean, it's an older audience. And mm. those are people that are less likely to, you know, be sitting there fucking with their apps and sure. figure out new platforms. Sure, to do sure. it, you know, and they they still listen to CDs. And my kids, I don't think to tell you the truth, I don't think even my kids and you know my kids are eighteen and twenty, my two older ones, I don't think they've ever even owned a CD or used a CD. Amazing, amazing. I still remember making mixtapes for my me and my buddies and my girlfriends. Yeah, that's funny. Currently, you work with Battlecross, Crimson Shadows, and Blackfast. What is the one quality that you believe is shared? among all the artists on your roster that whatever it takes attitude those core values whatever it takes no Uh, excuses no excuses take responsibility do the right thing that work ethic and what is one way for an artist to ensure that they will never be a member of the phase media family (laughs) don't believe in any of those things don't you know easy enough come up with excuses i can't i have a kid i can't i have a job fuck your job I, you know, and I agree with that. And that's a conversation that I had. Again, every every band I've been in, every musical project has taught me something. And the thing, one of the things that I've learned is that if you don't tell people exactly what you expect, you will never get exactly what you expect. So when I had the first band meeting, I wanted them to know it's like I, I I've been in a, I've had a job before and been in bands. And every job interview I have ever been on, I got my first job when I was 14 years old, making a dollar an hour as, yeah. a, as a bottle boy at a party store, right? And I told them when I got hired for that job and every job there subsequently, I'm a musician, I have a band, and sometimes I have to practice and sometimes I have to play shows and maybe I'll have to go out of town for an extended period of time. Music comes first. Right. So if, if you don't like it, sorry. Yeah. But I'm here and they while all I'm here. Hired me, and they all hired me. Yeah. No one said, we won't hire you because you have this musical thing going on. And even when I got into a situation, or, or when I, that means that when I got into situations like uh, I need tonight, and or I need this night and the next day off because I have a big show and I'm not going to be ready to work the next day. Da, 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 da. And yeah. they're like, okay, right? Because what can they say? They can't say no. You agreed to this in the interviewing process. The problem I find is most band members don't talk about that part of their life in the interview because they're afraid of not getting. Oh, okay, we'll share. <laughs> they're afraid of not getting the job. Yeah. Okay. So. But then the thing is, is you, so what, you're going to drop that on your employer, uh, you know, months down the road or weeks down the road? It doesn't matter. You're going to drop that on your employer months down the road or weeks down the road. Right. And unexpectedly. Right. Okay. If you tell your boss up front, you are a musician and exactly. that is the number one priority in your life. Right. They will understand that. Yeah. So, yeah. So when you say things like, fuck your job, that's how I feel about it. It's like, you know what? <laughs> You need to set the tone going into that job, and that job isn't forever. And, you know, that's funny, too. You talk about working at something, you know, I had to work and work for years not getting paid to figure it out. To figure it out and da, right. da, 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 da. So many people say, you know, oh, there's no money in it or, or, you know, you're not good enough or, you know, what if it doesn't work out? There is no such thing as job security. Right. There really isn't. Because at any point, whatever company you work for could be sold to another company and, and your job and everything right. is, has it's been. gone. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, you know, what are you working for? You know, the the quote unquote American dream. Oh, go to work for a company for thirty years mm-hmm. and build up a bunch of funds in retirement, and then when you're in your fifties or sixties or whatever, you have a nest egg that you can chill on. But okay. This sounds awesome, though. <laughs> it does. It does. 
But that's what I want now. As rapid as as rapid as everything changes in our world, especially now the the technological revolution that we're still going through, uh, that doesn't necessarily exist anymore. But people's brains. Uh, in the mainstream or, you know, just quote unquote normal people, their brains are wired that that's still the program we need to be running for ourselves. This is a new program that hasn't existed for more than a century. Right. Okay. It wasn't until the greatest generation set, helped set this education system up and create that American dream path. I know they're squeezing it. Sorry, they're hurting me. Here, we can switch. No, I can. Can I do it without it? If you want. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Ouch. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, they're they're squeezy, especially if you're wearing glasses because uh. they pinch. Um, you can work at a job for ten years and build up, you know, whatever. And you, yeah, you get your steady paycheck, and then after ten years, you get promoted to this level of ease and comfort where you don't have to work as hard and you get more money. Da 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 da. That's the same thing as doing a band, except for those first 10 years, you're just not really making any money at all. There isn't right. a steady paycheck. Right. But you're still investing your time for a greater goal. Right. You don't have to do it by by climbing the corporate ladder. You can do it in your own way, but right. it's just it's the perception of people around you. Agreed. You know? Uh, yeah, I think... I think people. I, I, I'm trying to change paradigms here, Velda. Yeah. You know. Well. Talk about. Oh, oh, okay. How? Oh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I didn't realize My you had ears dainty hurt. ears. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? What to you is the most difficult part of doing your job for your artists? Or are you? And I'm, okay, I'm not going to put words in your head. Let me see. The most difficult part of doing. The juggling of personalities and making them happy because ultimately the band is the boss. Right. And I, the diff- most difficult part, even though I think I've done an okay job of it and I hope that they agree when they listen, is that I know what they want and I know how they operate. So I make some decisions. Uh, I make some decisions based on what I I think they want. And 99% of the time, I'm right. Mm. Uh, but that 1% is very difficult for Give me, me a friend. Okay, tell a story. Give oh, us a for instance. Oh, jeez. I, mean, I mean, literally, it's only been a couple of times. Um, I mean, even at the very beginning that, you know, like the biography that I had written. On their, you know, they didn't like it. They wanted it a different way. So, you know... They did it, and they they were right. You know what I mean. And I made the, a wrong move at the beginning. Um, uh, see, there hasn't been very many instances, but however, the instances and the decisions are constant, and there's always that thing in the back of my mind that says, you know, am I sure if this is what the boys want, or if this is, you know. And you don't have the the time necessarily in the moment to contact them. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. You Sometimes I don't, but you know, but I do make decisions. And hope that they don't hate them. Like, you know, some merch designs, you know, and sometimes I'll go move forward with the merch decider, the decision what merch they're going to take on the road or mm. whatever. And, you know, when I'm wrong, they tell me. And I'll get, I've gotten in trouble, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> but there hasn't been that many instances. Right on. Where I can come up with, a, but, but that is a difficult part of the job for me is that just tinge bit of a doubt that I'm doing the right thing. Because I know how important doing the right thing is to them. Right on. And I think that, you know, you know, there's been some money decisions that I've made that are probably, you know, weren't the right things. But in retrospect, it got us to where we needed to be. Right on. You know. Right on. Talk for a minute about just as a human being, beyond, beyond being the band manager, but just... Personally, talk about what you deal with as an entrepreneur and business owner and how do you balance your time and energy to optimize your life, your family time, et cetera. Well, you know, one of the things that I go through as a businesswoman is to where to invest my time, you know, um, and because you can do, you have autonomy. Well, yeah. You and can there, do you whatever know, you want. Right. So it's like, OK, right. I can do anything. What should I be? You right. Know? And, you know, what is best? For, you know, ultimately, it's like what is best for my children? What is best for my, you know, home and where are the opportunities that will pan out to something and it, 
you know, me having to figure out where to invest my time because, you know, some of the things I have to invest my time in are not, you know, monetized or not measurable, you know, the time that I spend with my children or, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, those are one of the things that you go through as an entrepreneur is to figure out how to balance your time. Um, for a long time, I didn't have any type of personal life or anything like that because I was so focused on Battlecross and, um, you know, trying to make a living and everything that I let everything else fall by the wayside. And, um, you know, I struggle with that too, where I'll be working and I'm like, I get, I need to get up and go for a walk or I need to get up and put Bella to bed or I need to, you know, do these things that are regular life things that I have to remind myself to find balance in. Otherwise it will just overtake your whole life. So you haven't so. necessarily figured it out. You every day, no, you're, every you're day. Just right on. Yeah, That's every good. day. It makes me and feel I do good. set goals for myself or, you know, whatever. But, you know, the reality of things is sometimes, you you know, every day doesn't present itself in a way that you can meet them. I had to cross out a bunch of stuff that I planned to do that I didn't do because I was doing the other right. things I needed to do. Right. But at least you wrote them down. At least you put them on the list for next next week. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Life it, happens. Yes, it does. And But the thing is, 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 okay, when you say life happens and when I say life happens, it's completely different. From the people who aren't getting after it, the non-entrepreneurs right, right. saying, "Oh, you know, it's life, man. It's just how it is." The, there are things that I, I say a lot. Uh, you know, successful people are willing to do what unsuccessful people are not right. willing or right. potentially able to do. So, it's more of a willingness to sacrifice and give up the things. You know, um, I, I found that. Going through my experiences and, and uh, you know, living in my car in Nashville, things like that, I've learned that I can live with a lot less than I thought I needed yeah, before I went thing. through those experiences, same right? Thing. So I'm so minimal now. It's like I don't need to get that thing. Do I want that thing? Yeah, sure. But I've learned to uh, – uh, I've, I've developed the uh, – I've developed the propensity to disdain things um, that I cannot have right. and that ignoring them is the best revenge. Kind of comes from Robert Greene's right, right, right. uh, Forty Eight Laws of Power, but um, rather than want them and covet them, I just go, ah, I don't need that. Whatever, Pfft, right. move on, move on, right. and that way I can p- focus my energy and my time and my resources on what truly matters. Because, right. like you, like you said, hey, instead of blowing that <laughs> again, one hundred and fifty bucks on an ounce of weed, I I had bands that I've worked with in the studio that I've recorded. That, oh, we can't, you know, uh, can we pay you next week or can we do this or what? It's like, this is your art. Right. You, who, who are you working with? Who's producing your album right now? Right. I'm almost insulted that you haven't figured out how to pay for this yet. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But yet your beer never, yeah, the, your the beer, beer is ends. always in the fridge. Right. You know what I mean? You can't tell me that yeah. you don't have money, oh, but you're able to drink alcohol every right. night. Oh, you there's can't plenty tell of times. me that you don't have money, but you can smoke weed. Yeah. Like, oh, there's plenty of times I've went without groceries to make sure there was money in the Better Cross count. Goddamn right. <laughs> Sacrifice. Yeah. This comes first. That's right. and, and yes, and that's, and, and that's the other thing that I learned is Many of the groups I've been in, the band does not come first. It's it's it, it in some cases it was my the perception my parents have of me comes first. Oh fuck that! In some in some ways it's it's my spouse or my partner's feelings come first, or my job, or you know I have a mortgage or I have whatever blah blah blah. I could, but you know I, you I do could. have to find a balance of those things. But but you know ultimately this is how you want to bring in money and you want to if you're serious about it you want a career in this. So, you know, you're going to put the same effort into it than you would be finding a job. And, sure. you know, and, and I don't want to say that, you know, balance is important, you know, mm. you know, for many years, I, you know, battle cross like practically, you know, I don't want to say they were my boyfriend, you know, yeah, there were, no. but you know what I mean? Having a band, that was my time. Yeah. But, you know, luckily, you know, n- now I'm in a relationship where it's like, I'm, I understand now the value of having a relationship and, you know, the balance that it provides me in my life. And people do need to have that. But, you know, ultimately, this is how you make your money and, you know, what they want. Mm. And you have to do whatever it takes to get there, I guess. I, I like it. Uh, I have a series of questions that I ask all my guests. Okay. But before I get to those, I want to ask you one question. Uh, what, what do you believe is the most important thing that being a manager of bands, of, of artists, has taught you? Um Well, it didn't teach me this, but it emphasized emphasized it was the importance of responsibility. It's, you know, when, as a manager, you have 
five young men or more, if you have more bands, that you're responsible for their careers. And you're accountable to them, their parents, their spouses, everything, that you're going to take this time and effort and sacrifice that they put into it and make something of it. And the that weighs on you quite a bit. And that sense of responsibility is so much more profound than you ever would think of it otherwise. So that's very, very important, and that has taught me that. Um, um, it's also taught me that there's nothing that I can't achieve. Uh, I mean, I have done some pretty weird and diverse things in my life in, in very grand scales. Uh, you know, my ex-husband Dan was over last night with Bella, and he was talking about, you know, how I had sped up the process through the federal government to through Boeing and through the Navy to acquire an F-18 Blue Angel for one of the museums and that museums were on the waiting list for five, six, seven years and I was able to get one within weeks because because of you know the connections I had through the museum and my mm. ethic and my hard, you know hard work and I was determined to do it and um, so I mean I had that in my mind already that I was very confident in my abilities and what I could do and the things that I could achieve but then here's something that didn't seem so complex as getting a Blue Angel or, you know, some of the other projects that I've done. But, you know, because it was a heavy metal band, people want to discount it. However, when I look at it, it's taught me that there's really nothing that I can't do if I set a set of core values and a strategy and with a great team anything is, is achievable the moral is to the physical as three to one that's what uh napoleon bonaparte said sure. that he, saying that the the desire and the will of right. my army is three times right. worth the value of an army that's three times the size of right. mine in physicality because my army will take them out and that's and that's what it is that's what you that's what you're dealing. I can't. Ah, okay. I can't. Right. I'm going to drive home. I'm just being. I'll finish it. I'm <laughs> just being though. polite. Um. I, I. It's not lost on me the weight that you feel that oh, you sure. carry because you're responsible for the lives of human beings and 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 the the ability to help them achieve their dreams. And I think that's pretty awesome. Well, I mean, I, I think that it's a even a greater testament to the type of young men that they are and the fact that you know anybody would do that you know do these things for them i mean that's how much i believe in them mm. and that's what's missing from so many other bands right is that belief from someone and you know if you don't have the character and the work ethic and subscribe by those same values you're likely not going to get anyone of quality to back you up and to support you because you know those are four of the best dudes I know. And I've worked with, you know, great executives from GM and all these other marathon and Boeing and all these things in my past life. But I've never met four better dudes than the dudes I work for now. Awesome. Awesome. All right. How often do you talk to yourself? Every day. Out loud? No. Okay. In the mirror? No, just okay. in my head. Right on. What uh, what do you tell yourself when you screw up, and do you punish yourself? Uh, I don't so much punish myself. I just um, I have trained myself to put it behind me, learn from what I did, and make sure I don't fuck it up again. And you know, I think of the consequences and what I could be doing better. I'm, I'm particularly hard on myself. I don't punish myself per se, but um, there's definitely lessons learned that, you know, make it very evident. I'm very reflective and very self aware. So would you say you're, that you are your own worst critic? For sure. Yeah. Me too. That way yeah. nobody else has to be. Yeah. And I don't want to disappoint others. You know, I don't want to disappoint others. That's something that I take pretty hard. What do you tell yourself when you do well and do you reward yourself? I don't particularly reward myself, but I just will remember that this was the right way to do it or this was something that went well and to make sure that that lesson and that example comes through in another situation. You know what I mean? That this is the way that I'll handle it this time. Yep. Again. How do you relax? 
uh, I drink wine and I smoke weed and I get in the hot tub. And I love, you know, sometimes I like just chill with my kids. My boyfriend is the ultimate chill master. Um, I am every time I'm with him is very relaxing and very fun. So, um, that's a good time. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, go get a massage or get in the hot tub and whatever. Sweet. Yeah. Who would you say is the most influential person in your life? And of all the lessons that this person taught you, if you had to gather all those lessons up and you had to throw them all away, but you could, you were allowed to keep only one lesson, what would that lesson be? Oh my God, that's heavy. The most influential person in my life. I mean, I think it's going to be kind of corny to say it's my boyfriend, but he influences me a lot. Um, I've learned a lot about myself from him. Oh, my therapist. She's very influential. You see a therapist. I see a therapist every Monday at 2 p.m. for the last, I don't know, three or four years. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean. I see mine every other Tuesday. I, I, I don't see why. I, I just don't see why anybody won't, wouldn't do the same. If your insurance covers it and you have someone to bounce thoughts and ideas and conflicts and experiences yes. and what they mean and how they affect you and how not to let them affect you and barriers that you're hitting in life and have someone to provide that feedback to you so you could live life as healthy as possible on the inside. Why wouldn't you do it? And then, you know, to the point where it's like, okay, well, once you get to the point where you're, you know, healthy and functioning internally as a person, then you can really spend time on your external and, you know, have it benefit the people around you. And, you know, I think it's very important. Therapy is very important. And, and I'm a former social worker, so I know the value of therapy and I know the value of solving problems. And, you know, who wants to live their life conflicted or depressed or holding on to bad experiences when, you know, you can go to a therapist to help you. I mean, when you break your arm, you don't just sit around and, you know, let your arm heal on its own because it's never going to heal right. You go to a doctor. So why not do the same old thing if you're hitting mental roadblocks and life roadblocks and relationship roadblocks? You know, why not fix that? I, maybe there's a, just this. There's a stigma of something's wrong with me, or and and a thing. There a, is something wrong with you, so fix it. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But to your to your point about oh, if you break your arm, you're not going to sit there and deal with. It. But breaking your arm is something that quote unquote happened to you right yeah and so it's easy to go hey bang this happened i broke my arm i'm gonna go to the doctor and get it fixed it's a quick fix therapy is a long fix yeah but it, all those it, things happen to you too right but and but and also with a lot of people what happened to you you may not either realize it happened to you uh uh remember it happened to you <laughs> Or wander. Oh, hey, Jackie's home. Yeah, Jackie, this is Velda. Hi, Velda, Jackie. This is Jackie. It's good to meet you. You're so cute. <laughs> um, uh, but and you can't see the damage that's in your mind, right? Yes you, and no. You know, well, okay. Well, mindful people can. Yeah, if you're self-aware and you see, okay, well, my relationships aren't working out, or you know, I I'm not doing the best that I can, and. You know, I end the day thinking that it's not the best day that I've had, you know, then if you're self-aware, you see, okay, well, there's something wrong, mm. you know. So, okay, so to answer that, to answer the question, you're saying your boyfriend and your therapist are the most influential people in your oh, life. Oh, yeah, and my kids, of course. Right, you know? okay. And what what lesson has your boyfriend taught you that you would take with you? Oh, geez. Oh, gosh. Uh, patience. Um, what else has he taught me? He's taught me how to relax. Um, he bought the hot tub. And no, 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 oh. the hot tub's been there. I just got it fixed. <laughs> um, to take time for myself, uh, to take better care of myself. Um, he's so you're in a relationship with with a partner who is actively guiding you to put yourself first, even. In, in all things. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. And, and when we're together, we always go do something active. Um, you know, it's like healthy body, healthy mind, you know, Absolutely. sort of thing. Um, you know, he influ he's been very influential in helping me, eat, you know, eat better because, you know, when he was a, you know, offensive lineman in the NFL weighing 300 and something pounds, six foot seven, whatever, six foot six, you know, and now he's a lot thinner mm. and... And I am a very dutiful girlfriend. You know, I love, you know, I, I'm a certain kind of girlfriend where I always 
you know, cooking for him and doing for him and whatever, whatever. Well, I know that I can't cook a certain way for him. My regular Mexican, you know, wife way. Mm. <laughs> he doesn't eat that food. Right. So, you know, he's influenced me and has taught me to create awesome dishes that are, you know, that he can keep the weight off and that are also healthy for me and changes the way that, you know, I feed my family. So that's very influential to me. It's funny that you say that because when Jackie and I first started dating, she was a pasta queen, like oh. pasta, pasta, pasta all the time. Right. And now it's zucchini noodles yeah, I don't think and I've ever spaghetti made him squash. Pasta. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't think I've ever made him pasta. And it's a testament to her, you know, shout out to her. And I know she can probably hear me around yeah. the you know, room, she but, will. but no, but it, it's a testament to her and, and you know, it's okay. This is what he likes. And he's shown me the data on yeah. why it's better to live <laughs> right. this way. And I, you know, like, yeah, yeah. He, I, I think it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Pretty so, sweet. He, I mean, he influences me in ways that are good for me, for the most part, minus the wine and the gambling. <laughs> and the gambling. Yeah, the wine and gambling. That's Remember how we had that conversation about how the football life is far more wild than the, yeah. the metal life? It's the gambling? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's Well, it's the gambling and the drink. You know, they party hard. Right. You know what I mean? Tailgating so, and all that. Yeah. And, and yeah. just even after games and... You know, it's just pretty much centered around ca- casinos, hunting, and drinking. You know, oh, I would love to go hunt. I've never been hunting. I want to hunt so oh. bad. Um, and I would love to join you guys at a tailgate one of these uh-huh. days. What makes you laugh? Silly shit. Silly shit. Okay, like Mel Brooks movies. Oh, uh, like you know, like Norm Macdonald, Howard Stern. Have you seen new- Norm Macdonald's new stand up? Yeah, I started watching it the other day. I haven't seen it all. Oh, and Keith has introduced me, you know, because he's older than me and he loves to laugh. I mean, we watch Jackass and shit like that. Mm. It's so, I mean, I like stoner funny shit, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, because my life is so heavy with the data and all the thinking and shit like that. When, when I want to be entertained, you know, I want stuff to just be simple and laugh. And he introduced me to, well, you know, I always have known Richard Pryor, but right. you know what I mean? But he, you know, that was, Richard Pryor was around when he was in college and in high school. Right. So it's like, we're watching Richard Pryor stuff and, you know, things like that. That stuff makes me laugh. Right on, right on. And I, real stuff, you know, you know, I'm from the hood. So it's like, especially if you got a black comic is funny and, you know, Canadians are funny, just shit like that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What makes you cry? Um, awesome, good deed kind of things. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people doing something to relieve the suffering of somebody else. Um, bad experience and things like that don't really make me cry much. But uh, just, uh, you know, just sad things as, as a bleeding heart liberal that I want to fix. Okay. Yeah. And that's to you, Keith, for not thinking that a person's heart that bleeds is good. He's a, re- a stone-hearted Republican. Well, it's it's great it's great that you guys have a relationship. That, okay, yeah. okay. Well, if, yeah, if you don't Carville, mind, I want to go there. James okay. Cargill. James Carville and Mary Madeline. I tell them they, you know, they're Republican and Democrat, married to each other for twenty years. If right. they can do it, we can. Uh, see, okay, so how do you, you you talked about having a falling out with someone who was a dear friend of yours over over the the political differences? Yeah. This is the kind of the climate we're living in right now, yeah. and it's almost like. The politics is the TV that everyone's watching. Right. Like you know, it's not it's not everyone's watching The Walking Dead or Better Call Saul. They're all watching CNN. See, I mean, you know, I've never whatever. even seen those shows. Okay, so, right. <laughs> so you got to spend your time wisely. I don't watch TV. You know me. Seriously, seriously. So how do you guys countenance that then between the two of you? Is it is it a, is it we don't talk about the you know our differences? It's taboo, or well, you try to educate each other and, well, and try I mean, to bring each other closer to the middle? At first, we were trying to educate each other and stuff. And then I think that me growing up as a girl from the east side of Flint, you know, with, you know, death and crime and everything around me, even though I had a wonderful childhood, like I said, you know, but living very working class, whereas he grew up in Hollywood, Florida, played professional football and, you know, his parents were veterinarians, had a completely different kind of life. So I came to the thought in my mind that, you know, our political thoughts are shaped by our experiences. And by the way, you know, I was trained as a social worker. I was, you know, just saying this, I was trained to empathize and advocate for others that were less fortunate for racist, you know, for reasons regarding to socioeconomics and race and, you know, all these things that, you know, don't level the playing field or whatever. But, you know, those are how my experiences are shaped, and that's how his experiences are shaped. And I can, when he says things, 
you know, gone are the thoughts in my mind. Oh my God, how, that's so stupid. Whereas now I come to the understanding, it's like, okay, though, that's how his experience is. That's what shaped him in his life. But listen to him and understand him. And then I always say, honey, I love you anyways. I love you. I love you no <laughs> matter what. <laughs> and now we're at the point where it's like the other day we were texting each other and he's like, let's just not talk about it anymore. So that's the agreement now. We're just not going to talk about it. Right on. And I love him. And, and I, but I understand where he gets his point of view and you know I think he kind of understands my where I get my point of view and we can just agree to disagree there's a lot of things that we do agree on right on politically right uh, you know but some of them don't it's yeah because it's it's funny He's you say smart. that too because when I saw Trump when Trump and Hillary were running I I thought of my people right and you're one of my people and oh. I thought I know Velda she's a big oil queen i do and, love my like, oil like, industry <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like he's got Tillerson wanting to come in he's got I'm like Feld is probably a Trump supporter, and then I'm not. right, and so it, it's 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 interesting, you know, to see where you draw the line in the sand. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I everyone's do. everyone's got their thing. You know, once you have, and I don't think I had you pegged per se, but you know, it's funny. You can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a person by one thing they say right. or one exactly you know, one experience yeah. or whatever. Because right? he's totally pro immigration. Oh, you know right what I mean? And you know, and other things. And I'm totally pro oil industry. You know, someone's got to put the roofs on houses. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. sorry. And do our la- a lawns. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, tell me. Tell me about a time when you truly suffered, and what you learned from it. Oh, geez. Well, I mean, from you know, losing my career in the museum world, from being a whistleblower. You know, losing your career. Yeah. You okay. know, I mean, I'm sure I've told you the story, but you know, that's how I left my career in the, in, in the museum world, the nonprofit world, was they were mismanaging the money, and I told. And it ended up closing down the museum. Dan lost his job too, and mm. that you know put us at odds. The and, science center. Yeah, that oh. was closed for a year. You know, and I closed it down, and that essentially was the end of my nonprofit career because everybody in the nonprofit world in the Detroit area knew what happened at the science center. Even though I had raised tons and tons of money, right? I was also the person that closed it down. And people, you know, think, okay, you raised the money, then you spent it. I didn't spend it. You know what I mean? So that was the end of you know my okay. 20 year career. I want to make sure that I'm painting a, the clearest picture for the audience as possible. So what you're saying is you got hired to do a job. Yeah, for you many did, years. You did your job so well and 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 created a lot of success. Millions of dollars. Did exactly what you were expected to right. and went and went above and beyond and then you discovered they mismanaged it. You discovered bad practices yes. and poor ethics in right. within the job you were hired to do. That was against and, my core values. Go ahead. Right. And you called them out on it. And right. because of what, what I the, did. whistleblowing, the, it, it collapsed. But then the perception that was created out of that right. whole mess in the industry was that you were the perpetrator? Well, no, I wasn't the perpetrator. It's the fact that in the nonprofit world, especially fundraising, one of our most important ethical things that we got that we you know guide our work is that to fulfill donor intent, that whatever the money the donors gave, millions of dollars, that it would go to the purpose that it did. Mm. Okay, so I was responsible for that. But the museum then used the money for other things. I didn't fulfill donor intent. Ah. So then now the philanthropic world, they can't trust that I can fulfill donor intent. So really, I was. So you were and, kind and, of blacklisted a well, little bit. Well, not so blacklisted, but just the ability where it's like everybody knew about it. When I would go interview for places, they'd ask about it, and gone was my confidence and things mm. about it. So you know, it was a hard thing to talk about. And on top of that, my marriage ended because of it, and then put me in a position where then I didn't have any more money. Wait, you so, and Dan split because of. Well, yeah, because he worked there too. And all of that stress of it all, you know, uh, was okay. bad for a relationship, sure, and I sure. shouldn't have said anything or whatever. And you know, and we were, you know apart for a while and you rocked the boat and everyone fell off yeah but it was the right thing to do one of my core values wrong okay? boat yeah and um, you know 120 people lost their job or whatever and then and essentially I really had you know even though I loved Battlecross and had already been working them with them a couple of years mm. I ultimately really had no choice but to throw 100% of my time into Battlecross so I could make money it was my only way to make money right so would you that say time, that time that was when I really suffered, where I went from a beautiful home. You've been into that big home, where I couldn't afford it anymore, right? And I didn't have money for senior pictures for my son, right? Or a graduation party, or a class ring. Did or... any of those things end up happening? No. The senior pictures, the class no. ring. Okay, because a lot of people would put it on a credit card, or they no, or they'd I didn't have money that. From I, right. I had already used the credit card and so, borrowed the shit to okay. even just have a home. So uh, beyond the suffering of, uh, beyond the suffering of. 
technically cost a hundred and some people their jobs and my marriage is fucked. You have to look at your kids and tell them, hey, the the things that other kids are having that you uh, probably expected, you know, yeah. they're just not going to happen. Right. How, how that had to be one of the yeah, hardest but they things. Understood, but they understood. But now you see what I was talking about earlier: the importance of succeeding to show them that you could have everything, then have nothing start from the bottom and achieve something. So yeah. that's why it was the pressure to succeed was far beyond anything because I had to show my kids that this wasn't in vain. Right. Right. You know? Right. I didn't just blow the whistle for nothing. I blew the whistle because it was the right thing to do and I'm not worried and I'm about gonna our show future. You why. Right. right. And I'm going to show you and 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 you know, especially my son, you know, he really understood and really got it. And he's like, well, I didn't really realize that we were poor. I'm like, really? We just left a 5,000 square foot house with four, you know, whatever whatever and now right. we're in the single mom special but you still managed he said i be- i believed you i believed in you and and i really believed in you once you know their dad had talked a lot of shit about me you know that i was having a midlife crisis and doing all this shit with metal bands and he's like it wasn't until we went to a pistons game or someplace they were at cedar point or something and we saw kids with battle cross shirts on that we realized that you were doing it it's fantastic yeah what what would you say is the defining moment in your career thus far was it that when you when you had the gumption to blow the whistle or was it another incident? oh and the career oh oh god when my old nonprofit career there were so many i mean i achieved such awesome things that there were so many defining moments okay. but none of them were sweet <laughs> <laughs> as, they were, but they were all learning experiences right right but none of them were as sweet as watching James Hetfield and Robert Trujillo introduced Battlecross and hang out with us afterwards. That was pretty surreal. For my audience that's unaware, James Hetfield and Robert Trujillo are the, the two, two of the members of, ba- of Metallica. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, James Hetfield is the front right. man and, and vocalist and the, the driving force. Well, him and Lars are the driving and force. Anyway. another defining moment, and this is going to get very personal, another defining moment in my career that my life was back and that my career was back was getting a Costco membership. <laughs> I cried at Costco after I got that because I had, that's how much I had suffered. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Was that I was able to once again get a Costco membership. Oh, so you had to cancel your membership because you well, couldn't yeah, afford I, it. I mean, I hadn't had a, oh, I couldn't even afford to buy in bulk. Did you ever get like an EBT card or anything? No, but still. Are, are you, are you, you're not above crowd, crowdfunding for a band. I know, oh, no, I know, no. I know I'm, not, I'm not above getting food stamps if I need to. I've been a taxpayer okay. for years. If I needed shit like that, I'd get it. That's what it's for. Right on. Okay. Emergencies. That's what I was asking. Because Costco takes EBT. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> How do you know that? Because I have it. <laughs> okay, you're right. Costco <laughs> takes it and Trader Joe's takes it. I can oh, buy my a, healthy food. A I can get Joe's. it on cheap. No, I didn't get to that point. But, you know. Thank you, taxpayers. Yes, I but, have an EBT uh, card. It's because I'm an entrepreneur and a musician. <laughs> In 2017, and, and you paid okay? into the system. The cat's out and that's of the bag. What it, and that's what it's for. You're damn that's, right. That's what it's for. You've paid into the system. How long have you paid federal tax or Social Security or Medicaid? If Years. you need it, it's there Ever for you. since I had a it's legal insurance. job. Yes. That's just like, and I was just explaining this to my boyfriend the other day, that's just like buying health insurance at your work and not going to the hospital when you need it. Right. And you know, it's it, it's... And we're going, we're going a little bit past 4 p.m. I okay. hope it's not a huge deal. Like maybe 10 at what time is it? It's 3.57. Okay, maybe another 10 minutes or something. Yeah, okay. 10.15. Tops, right. tops, 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 tops. Right. But I, in Bad on Fire, I had a band member who suffered from macular degeneration. Okay, in the okay. eyes? Yeah, legally yeah. blind. Okay. Le- well, well, not legally blind, but legally can't drive a car unless they wear these special glasses or whatever, right? right? And this guy lived in his parents' house. He lived in the same bedroom his entire life for like the first 25, 26 years of his life. Ouch. Okay. Family never moved anywhere. And because of his condition and he couldn't drive or whatever, he mostly was a homebody. Okay. So I get that. And, uh, he can never die- drive the tour van. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but he, he wouldn't be able to get a job though. Cause he couldn't drive to the job. And it's like, why don't you take public transportation? So I'm not riding the bus with all those people. Da, da, da. And, and I remember talking to him about getting social security benefits, you know, because of his condition. Right, and he's should. like, I don't need a, I don't need a fucking handout. I don't need anybody's charity. I said, you don't understand. Social security exists to level the playing field for disadvantaged Americans. This country is set up to, well, at least it was. It, it, uh, the United States of America is ostensibly in the business of leveling the playing field for right. everyone in the country so they can so contribute that, to the so economy. So they can build a business, 
buy a home, invest in the country. Contribute to the economy. Yes. It's cheaper it, for them to invest in people than to, you know, not have them contribute to the economy. The best investment that any society can make is in its own people. Absolutely. So when Keith I... Keith Euchre. Uh, nice. I had to so, tell him that. Yeah. You, we're bleeding heart liberals here. No, but... I told him, I said, you need to get on Social Security. You don't need to think of it as a handout. You need to think of it as, I am afflicted with this condition, and because I have this condition, and I no am not... no choice of my own. Right, by no choice of my own. I don't have the same advantages that my right. peers do. And the opportunities In here. order to help me have those advantages, there is a program in place to get it, right? right. So I, I end up getting him signed up to Social Security. Good and all for this. you. Right on. Yeah, and he used Good the money you. to you buy were... a PlayStation... Three and, and a couple games instead of paying me back the money or I uh, loaned him anyway, <laughs> and that's when he left the band. Um, what what's the defining moment in your personal life, if you have one, where like you you just had a paradigm shift, or have you always been essentially the same Velda? I've always been the same Velda. All right, then we're moving on. Uh, Very driven. What what is the biggest advice that you've received in your professional career? And how did you utilize it to oh, go to the next level? Steve Davis. Steve Davis was my partner in Battle Cross. He manages Children of Bodom and all these other big bands and whatever. And, uh, you know, I came into the music industry very combative almost, where it's like nobody was doing what they were supposed to do. Nobody was collecting data. It was a very frustrating experience by seeing a bunch of fat old guys running things and not really running things and having 50 bands on their labels and whatever, whatever. So I picked a lot of fights. I had a lot of fights. I remember that. Yeah, in the industry. And um, Steve would just be like, Velda, you're not going to win every fight. You can't push these men the way that you push them. You know, my professional career is very different than my personal way of treating men. But anyways, um, you know, you need to pick your battles. Grab him by the dick. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, I thought that that was, you know, a, a woman that, you know, in the music industry, you know, you know, I had a lot of challenges already as it is, but, you know, I found that being one of them was going to get me further than the way that I started off. Sure. Sure. So I need to ash. Oh, I'm sorry. It's right there. Oh, oh, hello. Thank you. Um, so what was the big, that was the biggest advice? Well, that was is, the, is, the biggest advice tone, was like, tone yourself down a yeah, little tone bit. Tone it down and you'll get more. And, you know, you I did. Get more bees, attract yeah. more flies with honey. Yeah, that business, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. But the, the, I think that the, and I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking here that knowing you, the idea of supplicating yourself or, or. It's okay. Okay. Because everybody has that perception of, of me that I must hate it or whatever. But personally, and as a woman, mm. I am very uh, accommodating and very dutiful in many ways. And so. It was the hard, you know, it was the hard ass alpha shit as mm. a woman that although everybody around me says I do very well, it's never, that was far more uncomfortable for me than, you know, oh, playing so, the game. So you felt like you were putting on like almost an alpha mask. Yeah, of uh, course. I had to because that's what I've always had to do is always being in charge of everything. Okay. You know, because everywhere I've worked or everything that I've done, I've always been the one in charge. Right. So, you know. Right on. I felt like I had to be in charge then too. And, you know, that was that. that's a, a behavior that I, I could always do well and had to do but never really liked. Right on. And uh, so actually it got easier. And actually it got um, – I found more balance that way, and I didn't go to bed wor pissed off or worried that the label didn't spend marketing on this, or they didn't include this in the press release, or, you know, they're not doing this for the pre-sales. You know, we found an agreement. You know what I mean? Sure, right on, yeah. right on. Uh, define success. Balance. Um, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, money, but uh, success to me is um, reaching your goals, um, being satisfied with the effort you've put into it, going to bed at night knowing that you did all you could and achieved the most that you could, um, not being too, too hard on yourself and learning from your lessons, being very self-aware, um, Good, uh, good, strong, meaningful relationships with people. All of that, uh, you know, with the people that mean the most to you. 
um, having the respect of others and being able to respect others and um, uh, the uh, ability and the strength to accept responsibility, know when you're wrong. Those are all things that define success for me. Awesome. Awesome. I want to play a little quick game of six degrees of separation. Okay. All right. I'm going to mention a name. Okay. And whatever comes to mind about this person, you okay. can give me a word. It could be a sentence. It could be a short story, whatever. Okay. Tony Asta. Uh, the happiest guitar player and great brother and full of energy and... Uh, And uh, a good, really good person. Trisha Asta. A saint of all saints. The ultimate band wife. I love that. Haran Duranayagala. Uh, a guru. Um, <laughs> Why are you going to call the Indian guy a guru? <laughs> Who cares? He's not that's Indian. So, He's Sri Lankan. Sorry, I apologize, Haran. Um, that's my ignorance. Uh, you know uh, I love you. That's okay. Huron is a peacemaker. Um, non-confrontational, um, the, the, uh, the one that holds it all together. The glue. The glue. Yeah. Awesome. Kyle Gunther. Wild and awesome. A stage presence that is undeniable. Um, silly. Wonderful father, great friend, great brother, a good moral person, and and people don't probably wouldn't believe it by looking at him, but he's a, a an amazing moral person and a good friend. He's a kind soul. Yeah. Don Slater. Genius, uh, misunderstood, uh, fragile yet strong. Uh, like an egg. Yeah, yeah, the, and holds things together. Uh, the backbone, uh, just genius is always just the just the unassuming genius, and as Keith would say, a bad motherfucker. <laughs> Dan Faze. Dan Faze, baby daddy. <laughs> uh, 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 he is a, 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 a visionary, very hopeful. Uh, in many ways, very unbothered. Um, he is a, um, full of hope, uh, very deep, good dad. And a friend. Awesome. What's next for Phase Media? <sighs> Phase Media strategy will ultimately mirror the battle cross strategy and the black fast strategy because we exist for them and because of them and uh it will be whatever it needs to be to take those bands further awesome what's next for you in regard to your growth as an individual uh well a return somewhat to my nonprofit roots i'm doing some freelancing work for some nonprofits. um Getting ready to ramp up uh, Jose Mangan's foundation for headbang for metal. He was going to be the another name that I brought up during oh. the six degrees. Oh, so he's a visionary. Okay, he's a visionary. Energy, good people, hardworking, ethical. He's a Mexican. What can I say? Mm. Right on. So you're, but sorry. So you're doing work for him. Yeah, I'm. I'm he, I've laxed on it somewhat because I know that I want to put 110 percent into it, mm. into this foundation. Um, because that's what he expects and that's what he stands for. And I'm going to abide by that. It's just taken me a while to get it started so I could get battle cross, you know, uh, you know, in going into this hiatus and while they figure things out, then I can put 110% into it. Right on. As he deserves. Where can people find you and reach you? I prefer that they don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> phase, phase media at gmail.com. That's or so Velda funny. at phase management.com. That's so funny. Yeah, I, I like to be un, you know, 
I don't, <laughs> I don't like to be contacted. Fantastic. I'm so sorry, everybody. No, it's, it's, it's only because I'm not looking for new bands, you know? <laughs> that's great. But, uh, you know. All right, I got one more question to ask you, and it's 409, so it's okay. perfect. All right. Um, but before I ask it, I want to acknowledge you for a moment. Okay. Okay, for your willingness to sacrifice, your uh-huh. the growth I've seen that uh, that I've been witness to over the last eight years of knowing you, but then also the growth that you've evidenced in, in talking about the last three to four years and going to your therapist and being with Keith and everything. Um, your love of accountability yeah. and your respect for it, um, your reputation for excellence, your intensity, your passion, your work ethic, your drive, your analytical mind, and last but not least, your no-nonsense approach to your craft and what you do and That's how you what, operate. Thank you. That's what the boys expect from me. Awesome. Last question. What advice do you have for those listening who have a passion and want to get after it? Set a strategy. Develop a strategy. Go get a book on strategic planning. And uh, you know, put your life plan and your career plan into a strategy. And adopt core values that are important and that are... Uh, that will guide your ability to reach those goals. What are the things that you know you need to believe in and live by to reach your your personal and your professional goals? And don't waver for them from them. Set goals, set accountability, set set tasks that have to be done every day, and look at them and say, the things that I'm doing or the things that I have to do, what is the purpose for it? Where is it going to lead me? And if you can't answer those questions, if it's not going to lead to anything, including television, sorry, you know, uh, don't do them. Do something that's going to lead to something and uh, don't don't uh, spend your time, invest it. Invest your time into something. That's my best advice. Whatever it takes, no excuses. Awesome. If you want it. Awesome. Thank you, John Kay. No, thank you. This is this has been great. This has been great. Um, you're uh, you are now my tenth guest, and you are in a, one of maybe the only one that is so business oriented. And you may think that it's boring for people to listen to this stuff, <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and tell you that for people in any in any industry, whether it's m- music or anything else, I know that most people that listen to this are probably musicians because that's the place where I operate from. Right. But it does not matter what industry your industry you're in. There is so much wisdom in what you're talking about that is applicable that I really think my audience is going to benefit so. from. So, guys, gals, I hope that you took copious notes throughout all this because. There's a lot of nuggets that you can apply to whatever it is you're doing and trying to get after yourself. So, Velda, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, John Kay. You're very well. I can't believe I did it. I'm, I can. <laughs> we did. The, we had the red wine. It, yeah, it yeah. works out. Yeah, it works out great. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, um, and maybe in a few months, I, I want to have you back again. I would be more than happy. Love it. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Velda Garcia. And if you did, please share this episode across your social media platforms. Word of mouth is huge. I'd also love to hear about what resonates with you. So send an email to getafterit at therealjohnk.com. And tell me what you liked or tell me what you did not like. Because feedback is the breakfast of champions. And breakfast is the most important meal of the morning. A big thanks to all of you who have subscribed to the podcast on iTunes. Feel free to rate the podcast, please and thank you. In addition to subscribing to the podcast, join my official mailing list and you'll stay up to date on all of my new releases and happenings. Just send an email to get after it at Real John K and say, sign me up. The next episode of Get After It will feature Chef Tony Mata, who is opening up a restaurant in the brand new Little Caesars Arena. Until then, you get after it. <laughs>